So I have a little. I don't want to. I don't want to give the the plot outline, but let me just give. I thought of a an easy way to introduce it, and in fact, I I sort of picked a way to introduce it because this is kind of about everything, right? It's it's metaphysics, it's epistemology. Yeah. But I I and, and I said, what what question are we trying to answer? And so I said, it was what can we meaningfully talk about? So I looked at this as one of the ways of summing up what he's doing here is there are three kinds of of statements that we can make when we're trying to do philosophy or something. Uh, one's about the world. Right, which can ultimately be analyzed into concrete statements about particular things, which are the kinds of things that we could potentially experience. Right, so uh, objects, whatever. Uh, number two, one's about the language itself, which basically just explain how the various words or signs in, in the language are related. And then number three, statements that might seem to make sense, but which really aren't saying anything, which are anything that do not fall into the first two categories. Does that seem fairly accurate? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we can go with that. Were the statements about the world are meaningful, the statements about language or what he calls senseless, because they're about logic and the limits of expression, and then there are the broader philosophical statements, which are nonsense. Exactly. And, and but not why, nonsense necessarily in a bad sense. You know, that's not, that's, can't prejudice. Well, I think <laughs> the, the no, sen- I mean, what's no, confusing about that is that the senseless yeah. ones, because he's actually, in that case... I think using the word sense, in the sense that uh, Gottlieb Frege uses it, which is, mm-hmm. it's kind of a, the, the meaning of a word, right? The distinct meaning of, of it. Well, it's its description, right? I mean, to go to the Frege reference, there's, that, there's the whole problem of identity, the morning star and the evening star. So and when, when Frege yeah, lays, out, lays out this distinction between sense and reference, which is the referent actually points at the object, whatever it is. Even if you don't know that you know anything about the object, what, whoever fills this condition, that's who it just points at. So if you say the morning star, you mean that body. Whereas if you say the evening star, you might not know that's actually the same thing as the morning star, the planet Venus. So even though those have the same referent, they have different senses. And he wanted to say right. that even the word sense, even though that sounds psychological, like which which property do you have in mind when you're saying it? He he thought no, that's that's sort of a logical feature of the language as well. He was, Frege was against the psychologists. So that's the background of this word sense here. And, and Wittgenstein, well, this is such an uninteresting point, <laughs> but Wittgenstein seems to be evolving the point that he really wants to use sense as reference, right? Well, because, which is sort of, yeah, and there's a reason to do that, which is that the idea is that any statement, any proposition about the world well first any anything that we think of as an object on a macroscopic level can be reduced to or any statements involving it can be reduced to substatements so if you say that, that is is in my room you can reduce that to propositions that are subdivisions of that proposition about bed the bed is a complex object and you want to reduce it to a description so the thing with four legs that blah 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 and this of course is related to to Russell theory of definite descriptions, and there we can discuss what what motivates all that. Does it make sense? Or? Seth, do you know what this is about? <laughs> I had a, a lot of trouble with really what these. So he he wants to say they're atomic facts, which are these basic facts, which are. But then I try to come up with an example, and none of them seem to work very well. Well, there's there's no there's no example of atomic facts. We don't. The it's like it's like Leibnizian monads. It's they're. Uh, the objects that make up atomic facts are are uh, not objects in our typical sense. Yes, yeah, I that that's I think the key point was. So my reading of it and kind of some of the commentary that I I looked through, they're kind of saying that the turn that he makes that's significant is that he says when he says the world is the totality of facts and not of things, he's moving away from a worldview that says that all of these objects. And the totality of objects and things and what we consider the physical or temporal space is what makes up the world. And he's saying, in fact, it's facts which are somehow related to those objects or things that make up the world. They're relations Uh, of those objects. Yeah. Yes. So we're we're getting at where where a fact is represented like uh, by something like X is Y or A is F, where F is a property. The dog is hairy. So the idea is that the ultimate constituents of the world is, are not going to be something like dog. They're going to be something like dog is hairy, except much simpler, right? Yes. 
I think so. Yeah. But Part what of could the... be simpler? I mean, because he does give examples like Socrates is wise, which makes it sound like components of atomic facts are supposed to be names, right? They're, they're, they actually can't be reduced to a description. They're just supposed to be demonstrative. They're supposed to pick out mm-hmm. the things. And it sounded like something like Socrates might be a fine candidate for that because he uses it as as his example. You don't think that's the case? No. Socrates is, is reducible to a description. It's the same Leibnizian idea. You want to keep subdividing the world until you get to those most basic objects and facts that can no longer be analyzed. So the, the, the fact that Socrates is analyzable means it's not going to be anything, any proposition involving him won't be an atomic fact. See, but yeah, I, an, I atomic, that... a, an atomic fact has to have a truth value. So, yes. you know, one of the key, the key features here is that when you talk about the world as a collection of objects, there's no truth or falsity implied in that which is what is how you get caught up in the question of existence. You know, is, does this exist? Is this, is this real? Is this not real? Can I sense it? Can I not? And what he's, what he's basically saying is that you have all these objects that combine to create states of affairs and a fact is somehow, and we'll get to this, but it's somehow a representation of a state of affairs and that that fact can either tr- accurately or not accurately reflect the state of affairs, and so it can be true or false. The world, what we consider the world, is that collection of facts, that true ones and the false ones, and not the collection of objects that, in essence, give rise to facts. Just to get, the, uh, get at the motivation for that, a lot of this is coming from Russell's definite descriptions, which is uh, something I'm... I think we should describe because go ahead. There's, there's the whole there's a classic problem of, of meaning where you take a sentence like the present king of France is bald. There is no present king of France. So the question is, is that sentence true, false or something else meaningless? The solution to that for for Russell is the what he calls definite descriptions, where you phrase everything, first of all, in terms of, so every proposition like that is, first of all, an assertion of the existence of the object. So there exists an X such that X is the king of France and X is bald. So you introduce this idea of the variable X, which Wittgenstein will talk a lot about, and therefore the, the proposition becomes false. And then you move on to the... You, you get you, you can create all sorts of problems at the level of a complex object because it's the, the kinds of statements we make in natural language aren't very fine grained. I thought he explicitly and I've been flipping through trying to find this this quote denied so one of the things that we didn't talk about live in Leibniz last time was the identity of indiscernibles, which is to say, like you've been saying that if if two things have all the same properties, they are in fact the same thing. But he, yeah. Wittgenstein specifically says in here that some things are only different in that they are different. It's it's that yeah. definite description does not work. So so giving all the descriptive elements of something does not give you does not determine the referent. The referent simply points at what it refers to, and there's no way through language that you can clarify what that is. I mean, you really just have to. It's a a, a basic demonstrative. Uh, unanalyzable relationship. I'm not sure about the whole identity of indiscernibles because I, I remember reading that um, and not knowing exactly what that meant. But there's this whole idea that, well, I don't know, Seth. What what are your thoughts on that? I don't know. Well, I I thought for a second Mark was kind of driving at the point about Wittgenstein says basically that a thing, and I'm not talking about a fact here, but an object mm-hmm. in the world basically contains kind of internally all of its right. possibilities, the, all of its possible yes, states of affairs, you know, all the different combinations it could be. Whether it's actually in those combinations ever has been, ever will be, right. it contains right. them within. And so to kind of restate the, the identity of indiscernibles question in that context, you would say, you know, an object that has exactly and only the same possibilities of joining in combination with other objects as this other one is identical to it and but that's like a hydrogen something. atom and another hydrogen atom i mean well but you could always distinguish them somehow spatially or temporally right i mean there's 
Yeah. He's basically putting off the question and saying, yes, you can make a, you can make a claim that these things contain all their possibilities and all that, but that's like a logical claim. And it's, yeah. it's, it's one of the statements that comes out of the Tractatus that you'll ultimately have to throw away and get rid of. Because so it's in that sense it, it it is senseless such as you defined it at the beginning of the the podcast. In other words, saying that two things are identical if they contain exactly and only the same possibilities is trivially true because it's sure. really a definition, and that's all that the principle of the identity of indiscernibles is. But in in actual practice, in terms of looking at facts and states of affairs and all that you'll never really run into this problem because you're always going to be making statements that are true or false about specific states of affairs and they will contain the objects they contain. And to, to say that it could be otherwise, <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't really have a lot of meaning to it. Now, do you think that he, think, let, let's just recap the overall picture because I don't want us to get lost in, the, uh, in some of the details here, that he thinks that the, the entirety of the world can be described in terms of these basic atomic facts. And when it can be described, that doesn't mean you right now can list them. <laughs> that is not right. feasible. But in theory, could be described yep. by this basic set of atomic facts, which have no logical relationship. They, they are logically independent of each other. That making one of them true, right. or w making one of them that's true false, would not change the truth value of any of the others. It would right. not make those they're, true they're ones false or those false ones true. Exactly. Uh, he does not <laughs> I use I that I love word. the parallels here. <laughs> and most of the facts that we concern ourselves with are then conjunctions of these basic atomic facts. Mm -hmm. And when we're doing analysis, we could try to... When we're doing the analysis of the logical relationship between statements, we try to see if one is reducible to the other, or really we try to reduce them to their, their truth grounds, right? Which is to say, we figure out exactly how the truth values of the individual components will affect the truth of the entire thing. And he does with these, with these truth tables that anybody who studied symbolic logic is familiar with. And apparently he kind of invented them in their, their modern right. form in this text. Um, and so... If you want to see, you know, does this statement imply this other statement, or does this proposition imply this other proposition, you look at the truth grounds, right? And if, if the truth grounds of one uh, cover all the cases of the other, okay, then that one implies the other. And that's, uh, you know, that's logic for you, <laughs> right? That's the picture. So we're stepping back then. We're trying to determine what are these atomic facts? Are these atomic facts things that themselves could be stated as propositions or do all the propositions that we could conceivably state amount to being compound facts, molecular facts? So you're saying, it seems like you were both saying that we, we don't actually ever say atomic facts ourselves. Or say, say, say statements that express propositions that mirror these atomic facts. I don't know, and I know, I just happen to remember from school that there's a lot of controversy about this in the, right. in the literature. There's a lot of disagreement about which of those is the case, whether there are stateable atomic facts or, or whether they're sort of just... Well, if I, I think he actually, in some of the later works, he talks about names only having meaning in context and that this is somehow a reversal. So we can, you know, if we wanted to, we could infer that, well, you can't say an atomic fact because a fact is a state of... The fact it represents right. a state of affairs that has a... Uh, you know, that can be pictured and has a The fact value. is the state of affairs. Make this clear. You, the, you, the fact is the state of affairs. It's the proposition. It's the thought. The thought yes, the, represents the, the thought. state of affairs or the fact. I suppose you could say the word dog. It wouldn't, me it wouldn't have any meaning because you're not saying anything about it. You're just saying dog. But what you might be implying is there's a dog in front of me, which would represent a state of affairs. So whether or not you can actually speak... You can't say a proposition about an atomic fact, or there's no such thing as an atomic fact, sorry. You can't just make a proposition about an object, a simple object in the world. And if you think you're doing it, you're wrong. But whether or not you, whether or not you can or can't, you wouldn't be saying anything meaningful. The atomic facts are like relationships between those objects, linked together like parts of a chain, right? Yeah, a fact has to be, so has to be a compound. There have to be multiple things right. or objects. Sure. 
you take a relationship between two objects. Exactly. No, I, I, yes. I got and the, the sense. objects only only obtain meaning by virtue of being in that relation, being in that fact. Well, the, in other words, the objects are logical consequence. They're, they're, we have exactly. to posit their existence just because of this theory. But the facts, the atomic facts are real. That there's no doubt about that. Right. That the the individual objects are kind of, you know, fictions of the theory, you might say. But the atomic facts themselves are real, which leads me to think. Right. Surely you must be able to <laughs> express them, since he says elsewhere in here one, one of the things. You're jumping ahead, kind of radically, the field of our potential experience is all that we can talk about. So that includes everyday experience, but ultimately it'll be reducible to of scientific statements. Right. So it would be... I don't know what you were trying to get at there, Mark. It would be a little peculiar if the domain of things that he thinks that we can talk about, that, that these particulars are going to pick out, and that atomic facts are going to pick out, is confined to our experience, but yet have atomic facts themselves be things that are outside the scope of our experience because they're too minute. Right? That we only ever talk about molecular facts, and we can never as a matter of practice, analyze these down into the atomic facts. I, I have to think that, given this commitment toward this empiricism, that atomic facts have to be something that we could actually state and understand. Okay, when you, get, when you say atomic fact, what, do, what are you thinking? What does that mean to you? What I, what I took to be the paradigm examples of this kind of thing would be you point to something and you say something about it. So I point to a spot in front of me and I say, that is red. That's supposed to be drawing a, la- a relationship p- between to that point in space it's and... Gotta a, it's got to be a pixel. Yeah, okay. It's Make it... Atomic. Right. Atomic. The space, <laughs> space is problematic for him, but... Right, so... No, no, no. I'm saying it's got to be a pixel in the sense of smallest unit of the computer screen, so to speak. Sure. And that okay. has a color, and there's your atomic fact. And right there, whenever I take it pick out an example like that, it seems problematic to me. In, in fact, it, sound, it sounds almost like he'd like us to, to treat the paradigm cases as that pixel is right next to that other pixel. Because at least that's, okay, that's two things that have a relationship between them. But as soon as I say that pixel is red, well, what is this red? That sounds like a universal. But he explicitly doesn't want to talk about universals. Yeah, right? that's a good that, point. So it's not a relationship between that point and the universal red, it has to be, say, something about its a relationship between that point and its color. And then maybe well, I the could talk about... Of, uh, yep. at, at the level, at the scientific level, though, it's this idea that all properties will be reducible to, the, to those relations between objects, like the one pixel being next to the other, that color will be reducible to something like that. So, so the Is fact that, that it reflects a certain kind of wavelength... And that's a physical property. But even even that, I mean, reflecting of a certain kind of wavelength, isn't that, if that's an adjective, then it's a universal, right? He, he certainly doesn't want to see, seem to be able to conceive of, like he doesn't talk about universals at all here in that sense, other than, let's see. So he says a lot of times we can say things like, for all green objects, and then say something about them. So in other words, you can use universals to pick out objects. And when you do that, you're really... universals of is that a problem? I'm not. I, well, the way he talks about it, he just wants to use it as a classificatory way of picking out individual things. In other words, he's going to say, yeah, normally with an atomic fact, you just want to say something about one thing. Well, here's a molecular fact that groups a lot of atomic things, and it's going to make a whole lot of statements because it's going to make an individual statement about every single green thing. So if I say every green thing weighs more than two pounds, so that's reducible. Of course, that's obviously false, but that's beside the point. It's reducible to a bunch of individual statements. That green thing weighs more than two pounds. That green thing weighs more than two pounds. So that doesn't seem to be a problem in terms right. of you're not referring to a universal as this abstract platonic entity that right. all the green things try to imitate or something. You're just saying this is a way of picking things out. But then how do you explain what all those things that you're picking out have in common? I guess... That this must be another kind of thing. Well, they're all green. That it's it's an un. That just like they, you, they you, have what they have in common is a certain set of ways that they're used in in propositions, right? Or the certain the, the all the possibilities of their linkages. Does yep. that make sense? You can well, he does talk about that relationship of colors to each other. So you could say, you know, this 
gray is darker than that gray. And so likewise, all, rela- all colors have certain relationships to each other in terms of if you just vary the wavelength, it'll go through the spectrum in a systematic way. So, yeah, that could be what defines green is that its relationship to the other colors in the spectrum. Green is defined simply by the set of all those things of which you can... Exactly. So it's a basic, it. unanalyzable, demonstrative relationship. Or did I just misinterpret what you were saying? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I, but I'm just th- I'm trying to think in terms of his idea of form and all, all the different ways that the, that, that predicate green is going to be used. And, and so instead of saying that there's some, I guess, form or essence in, in virtue of which, I don't know. I don't know. I'm in over my head. <laughs> and this is supposed to be the basic thing that starts off the whole damn thing. This is what is infuriating about this text. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of things starts... that are infuriating about it. <laughs> well, no, yeah, seriously, seriously. So, did you guys did you guys formally study this at all when you were, when we were in school? I think somebody taught a Wittgenstein class while we were there. I we did. Were, I took we it. Were forced I, to. I took it. We we walked through it line by line discussing everything in as much detail as possible. Did you go through it with a lair? Yes. Oh, God. Yeah, me too. We He's might have very been in that picky. class. I think we were in that same class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I definitely was not in that class. The only time I read Wittgenstein in grad school formally was class on, uh, like, meaning representational arts. So mm-hmm. we read all the sections about picture theory of the world and then read, like, Nelson Goodman, Ways of World Making, okay. and some other yep. Did you Have you ever read that? That's a great book, by the way. I, I um, did. I don't remember much about it. Yeah. I haven't read it. Yeah. Um, it might be a good one for us to talk about later. Yeah. Goodman, Goodman's very interesting. But anyway, there's what's really frustrating about Wittgenstein is that it sounds like he's saying, like, you can present this in such a way where you're like, well, was this guy like a, a like an elementary school kid? And why did everybody flip out about him? <laughs> right. <laughs> to, he, he's basically saying, like, this is you can represent this like this. The world kind of is what it is. And we form pictures of the way the world is in our head, and then we have ways of describing those pictures. And insofar as the the words and the ways that we describe those pictures correspond to what's actually out there, we have meaning. Well, I think there is a <laughs> radical idea there, though. No, I'd say it. That that's like one end because of the spectrum, it's... right? And then the other end can of the I, spectrum. Can I is, revise? The other end school, spectrum has been demonstrated kid, by a... the last 35 minutes of our conversation. Can I, re- can I revise one yeah. of the statements you just made in summing that up, though? It's not that we represent the facts in our head, because when he uses the word thoughts, which are the things that represent the facts, and we can tell that it represents the facts because it has the same structure as the facts, thoughts is used in the Fragian sense again, which is not a psychological thought that anybody is having. It's, it's a, a feature of logic. It's a logical, logical entity. Yes, yes. Yes, that points at these things, which makes the whole thing very hard to understand, of course. And it, and just a note to listeners, when, it, when you see the word proposition in modern analytical texts, that they're sort of using that in the same way. It's a hedging of bets. It's a way to just avoid the whole mind versus world problem altogether. Yep. But I think that there is a radical insight in, the, in this idea of picturing, which I guess we should go more into. Yes. Um, because it's not the typical idea of representation. It's this idea of the isomorphism of logical structure. And, you know, you take, for instance, the AFB. It's, it, it's not that AFB describes the relationship between A and B. It's that there you can see the that the structure of that the language is like a picture, and you can see that in the structure of the AFB, there's a reflection of a similar structure in the world. It tries to go beyond that classical problem of representation, where you you say there's this radically different mental representation and how could it possibly relate to the mind independent world and and Wittgenstein is getting at this idea that there's a form which they actually share there's this logical form which is just as much in the thought or let's just say that's just as much in the picture as it is in what's being pictured yeah Wes actually I just pulled up I found that section that the proposition that says what you just said is um what is the yeah it's three dot 
one four three two. So this proposi- this this particular line item in the text says, instead of the complex sign quote a r b unquote, and let me just say for listeners who it, it's kind of who may not be familiar with the notation, the a r b is small a capital R small b, and that's typically used to say a stands in a certain relation to b. So for example, Mark is taller than Seth. If Mark was A and Seth was B, the relation would be is taller than. So A R B would mean Mark is taller than than Seth. And what he's saying is this as a sign, this complex sign, quote, A R B, unquote, says that A stands to be in the relation R. He said instead of saying that, what we should say is that, quote, A stands to, quote, B in a certain relation, says that ARB. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, 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 so there's the, the state of affairs, the, the, say, say it like you just said it, Wes, sorry. That sort of pictorial relationship. So if you had a picture, you know, a real picture where you can see it in the sense that, you know, if you, if you had a picture of you and Mark and there's Mark next to you, well, take something even, take something even more obvious, like Mark is standing next to Seth. And then you look at the picture, you look at an actual painting, and there's Mark, and he's next to Seth. And then you can look at that sign, A-R-B, and you see that there's an actual, there's an isomorphism. There's the same structure in the actual sign. The, the sign yep. itself has that left and right. So that, that in a way, of course, not that's usually not going to hold, but that's the most basic way of thinking about that, that there's, an, there's somehow... A, a structure there in the in the representation which is shared with the world. Now, that that sort of spatial structure that I just described is usually not going to be the case. So it's going to have to be something logical. So in most sentences, you're not going to see that that the structure of what the sentence is describing is there in the sentence. So and so is the John is the father of Joe. You know, there's no there's nothing in the, the structure of the sentence that that looks like fatherhood. But something logically, something uh, in the logic there, it's going to be shared. If you were to analyze the logic of the sentence, it's going to be it's going to be shared. That really will be shared with the world. Anyway, so let me just read a couple of uh, lines from here about this this picturehood, because I think it it might help clear up uh, okay. the, the earlier thing about simples. So this is two point one, and then I'm going to read a little bit of that, and then skip ahead just later in two. We make to ourselves pictures of facts. The picture prevent, presents the facts in logical space, the existence and non-existence of atomic facts. The picture is a model of reality. To the, the, obje- to the objects correspond in the picture the elements of the picture. The elements of the picture stand in the picture for the objects. The picture consists in the fact that its elements are combined with each other in a definite way. Um, and then skipping ahead. What are you reading order, here? Which... This, is, this is the beginning of 2. Okay. And then skipping ahead to 2.16. In order for a picture to be a fact... I was sort of, sorry, in order for to be a picture, a fact must have something in common with what it pictures. In the picture in the picture, there must be something identical in order that one can be a picture of the other at all. What the picture must have in common with reality in order to be able to represent it after its manner, rightly or falsely, is the form of representation. Skipping down to 2.19, the logical picture can depict the world. The picture has the logical form of representation in common with what it pictures. The picture depicts reality by representing a possibility of the existence and non-existence of atomic facts. The picture presents a possible state of affairs in logical space. The picture agrees with reality or not, it is right or wrong, true or false. Okay. So there, there which says to me, if you're going to say, we, we make pictures and these represent the existence and non-existence of atomic facts, I guess that implies to me that, again, these atomic facts must themselves be something that is thinkable, not that the only actual thoughts we have are complex molecular facts, which then maybe you could eventually break down. But it, again, putting that putting that point aside, so that's how he sees this uh, representation. So we've got these thoughts, which are not things in your head, that are, are in the way you've described, have a one-to-one correspondence between the different objects in the thoughts, the subject and predicate, say, to objects, the simples in the world. That is, if you're you know, have a thought that expresses an atomic fact. And then on top of that, to add speech, 
The next part is about propositions, and to say propositions can express thoughts. And of course, there are lots of different propositions that can, can express the same thought. If you're just saying one thing in German and the other in English, they're two different sentences, two different propositions. Or actually, that's not even a good example, because uh, th those are propositions is still an abstract thing as opposed to actual words that people say. So we have, I think, four levels here. Statements are about propositions. Okay. Propositions are about thoughts. And two different propositions could express the same thought. So we already had that example from Frege of, you know, the morning star is, uh, is in the right. sky. The evening star is in the sky. Those are actually the same thought, according to Wittgenstein. Right? Because the, because the individual elements, the morning star and the evening star, both refer to the same thing, Venus. Uh, and then in the sky refers to the same thing, the sky. The, sorry, the sky refers to the sky in both cases. <laughs> And then you've got the relationship. They're, the, they're not the same thought in Wittgenstein, are they? They're not the same thought in, in Frege. Right, they're not the same thought in Frege, but I think they are the same thought the in same. Wittgenstein. They, they no, are, I don't think he, so. Well, yes, because he explicitly says, and this is a point we haven't talked about yet, but it's, it's very important that he thinks a lot of the confusion that comes in philosophy is because our natural language, the, the, the way propositions are expressed, does not make the reference of these propositions clear. And of course, a lot of that is we just don't know. So, like, if you don't know Clark Kent is Superman, or you don't know the Morning Star is the Evening Star, then you could make a statements about you could believe one statement. I believe something about Clark Kent, and not believe that same thing about Superman. But in what what he, I think he's talking about in this whole thing is not natural language. He says explicitly, natural language really makes this all very obscure. Is an ideal language, a logical language, and that language would express very clearly the structure of these atomic facts. And the right. main way that they would do that is all the reference, all the individual terms would be referentially transparent, that there would just be no synonyms in it at all. Right, but there would be no complexes either. Can I, I'm sorry, can I, yeah. can I take a stab at something here just to, um, yeah. okay. We have this, what you might call the actual world or the real world that's made up of all these objects in relation to each other, all these states of affairs. And then, Mark, as you just described, pictures, the logical picture of yep. a state of a, there's this space, this logical space where you have pictorial form that either accurately or inaccurately represent the states of affairs. So this is how you expand. You start with kind of the world that's limited to what actually is logical space where you have these pictures that represent the world or represent the possibilities that are inherent in the world creates the much broader space of everything that is and everything that could be. So, so there's sort of yeah. like actual things and then there's a much broader category of this logical space where you have pictorial represent representations of things and all the possibilities that are inherent in those things. Right. Okay. Thoughts are facts that could be – thoughts correspond to – facts which may exist or may not. Right. And those those logical pictures, I'm using the term picture on purpose here instead of the word thought, even though I think translation-wise yep. that we're talking about the same thing. A picture has has sense inherent in its... The content of a picture has meaning, and the truth of a picture can be determined by comparing it to the world. Is that correct? Yes. Comparing its structure... Form. Well, it has content and structure. It has it has logical structure in that it represents something, and then it has content because you have it's, to be. Able it has to, a reference. It has con but the I content is the reference. The content it's, is the, it's the reference fact that each element these, points to, at a thing, and to the relations of those things. The whole complex. <laughs> Bless you. Correct. The the picture, though, I think when we get to the again, we have to go to decompose it to the atomic. Well, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm just trying to okay. see if you guys agree. So you have sort of... Go ahead. We'll stop nitpicking. No, 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 no. I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm saying... Uh, <laughs> because... It, I'm saying I don't, th I don't think the picturing relationship has anything to do with content the way we think of it. But go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, he does say at one point, just in the section that Mark was just reading, that pictures, they, they do have sense. In other words, they do have meaning. You know, the picture, a picture in logical space of the world is a meaningful picture by definition because it represents, it has reference 
to objects and and their relations to each other. So it it pictures the world somehow. It is representational. Pictures in logical space are not abstract. They are representational. Whether they represent something that actually is and in, in such in, and so are true, or whether they don't represent they represent something that isn't and in such are false, is irrelevant. The fact is they represent something. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have sort of layer one is the world of actual things, states of affairs. Layer two is this pictorial space where you have all these, what's, what is and what isn't. And then you have language is kind of on top of that. And this is kind of what I heard Mark saying is that he talks about signs. But language is essentially a complex of signs that we use to try and articulate these pictures, these propositions. And I think that's where he says we get screwed up. What he's basically saying is all thought or all pictorial representation, all, all of this logical space, it's all representational. We, we are always representing something that's either true or possible, but we never represent anything that's impossible. And what happens is when we try to put signs and get this, this yet another layer on top of the pictorial that we get confused because our signs start to confuse us. The reference of those signs start to confuse us, confuse us. The way those signs represent the pictorial and logical form of the world confuse us. And he says, as Mark was saying, an ideal language would really just mirror in signage exactly what happens in this pictorial propositional logical space, which is a very impoverished way of looking at what language does and the human experience. But I think that's kind of where he's going with this. Yes? No? Yeah. Yeah, and, and actually, in what I was saying before, I think I was making it a little more complicated than it is, that I was saying that there's the level of the, the thoughts or pictures, and then on top of that, the propositions represent that, and on top of that, the statements represent the propositions. I think, actually, he's using these pictures, thoughts, and propositions all interchangeably. I think you're so right. you could inter... You could introduce that distinction when you're talking about natural language, that saying the morning star is in the sky and the evening star in the sky are different natural language propositions, sure. But for Wittgenstein in this ideal language, because the reference would be constant, they're going to be, they're going to be the same. Say just the last phrase again, because the reference are what? Right now we have to think that, okay, in a sense the morning star is in the sky and then the evening star in the sky are saying the same thing because they have the same referent. Right? But in another sense, the natural language, they're, of course, saying something different. And the way Frege analyzes that is to say, oh, they're different thoughts, but they have the same truth value. Is that how he talks? Um, right? they, I'm sorry, they have a different sense, but they have the same reference. I don't remember, actually remember how he uses the word thought. Yes, I think that's a, that's a more accurate way of saying it. But, okay, well, but the, we're saying the names have the same sense but different reference, but what about the whole phrase? What about the whole proposition? Is he saying those are different propositions, but they're the same thought? We didn't read any Frege for this week, so I shouldn't. <laughs> we should, maybe we should skip are... over that. Who cares about what Frege thinks about this? I guess my, my point well, no, no, is no, no, no. So, that... So Frege, Frege's, Frege's point was, if you say you know Cicero is Tully, that has more and different meaning than saying Cicero is Cicero, even though mm-hmm. the reference of that sentence is the same. Yep. You're, you're giving a different you're looking at different properties of that referent, and you may not realize that the referent is the same. And again, it's, Wittgenstein's it's, advance over this is to say, no, those are actually the same thought. You might I call them different so. propositions because epistemically we approach them in different ways, but in all the important ways, and as would be affected in the logical language, they're the same thought. They're, in fact, they're, it's because they're identity statements, they're ultimately senseless. You're pointing at a thing and saying that thing is that thing, and however you pick out it, pick it out. But I don't think that's an identity using, statement in the in the logical sense. Um, I think it is. So, if it's a if it's a demonstrative, ultimately, if all if all referential, if but it's not. But it's not a real. It's not a real demonstrative, though. It has to be reduced to. There's there's hidden propositional content in there. That's the whole. So what Frege is doing with sense just becomes decomposition into atomic states of affairs. If you take the concept of 
Tully and Cicero and decompose them, you would have things about Tully that in, in your concept didn't apply to Cicero. Now, the, the thing itself in the world, of course, it's the same thing. I don't, I don't know how to, how to express all of this, but I, I, I'm trying to get at the sense of object because I think the, the, the object is just the variable X. That's the way I view it. And that's why I don't think of pictures as having this form and content correlation in the way that a typical representationalist might see it. I think what Wittgenstein is getting at is you're going to get rid of that. You're going to take every everything that's in that picture and you're going to reduce it to, so you're going to say there exists an X such that X is this property and X is that property. And, you know, let's say you did it for a, you know, point in space with color. There exists an X such that X has this Y coordinate, X, X has this X coordinate, X is, has this color and so on and so forth. And the, so the object by itself is meaningless. It has no content. All content comes from factuality. So what a predicate is, it's this system of possible combination. So F will go with certain things and it won't go with other things. And, and so what F means is just the things it'll go with and things that it, that it won't. The meaning of green is just, okay, it goes with broccoli, it goes with green beans, it goes with, <laughs> to be tautological, it goes with certain other things, and it doesn't go with other things. And that is the form that ultimately gives us green. Yeah, Wes, I was just thinking when you were, when you were saying that, I, I think he uses this sentence where he says that objects have names. We, yep. name, we name an object, but that name essentially is sin, uh, zinlos, I almost said, um, senseless. That's, yep. that's, it's X. It's a variable. It, because it only really takes on any kind of sense and, or meaning when you start to put it in a propositional context. So Aristotle doesn't mean anything until you start saying Aristotle was a philosopher who Greek who lived in this time and wrote De Anima and did this and did that. Then it begins to have meaning. But the ability to make meaningful statements about Aristotle does not require you to enumerate every single possible proposition that the name Aristotle could be involved in, so to speak. This tie directly to the world so that, and this ability to picture facts or to create these pictorial facts allows you to, on the one hand, use names that themselves have no meaning but not go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and have to enumerate all of the potential propositional relationships for that name in order to say that you can make meaningful statements or refer to that particular name, which was Russell's theory of yeah, definite it's not descriptions. That you have to, not that you have to be able to enumerate all those things to use them, but it, your use of them, the, the meaning of them still implies all those, or it still depends on all those. Right. It's not that you personally have to be able to go through and, and decompose all those. No, things. no, absolutely. But he's. But it's but it's still that the, when you mean something or... or when something has a meaning, it still has a meaning only insofar as it has all those decompositions and then possibilities and all those things. 2.0123, if I know an object, then I also know all the possibilities of its occurrence in atomic facts. Every such it's possibility such must lie over. in the nature of the object. A new possibility cannot subsequently be found. Right, and when I read that, so that's that's I, very weird. Either either we just don't know objects, then we don't, or we do know all the possibilities of how things. In other words, if I if I talk about something in particular, I know that I'm talking about something that exists in space, so it has all these spatial possibilities. Of course, I can't list them, but I know the types. I know that it will have, you know, some color or other. I know that it can be, you know, all these other relationships. It can be owned by something. It can be whatever the presumably finite though large you know number of potential relationship with other things and that's that's what it is to understand what that particular is i i'm going to throw this out there i, did, I don't think we know objects i think objects are wittgenstein's version of substance I, I think this is a metaphysic i'm inclined to agree i definitely don't think that we know objects the the object is is the persistent substrate of of change, but this is logical change of all the variations. Let me let me return to a theory I was going to put forward earlier to ask you. So, do you think that there is, even though we can't know this and we can't list it, 
one particular list of atomic facts you that then makes it the world. What about the you list think of that there's facts? one list that we could, you know, in theory, come up with of all the atomic facts, and these would let us derive all the, you know, the compound facts. Only one arrangement of atomic facts is what I'm saying. I'm I'm struggling yeah, I'm struggling with the language again. He says atomic facts make up the world. Which if you list all which, the atomic facts? Which proposition is that? I just right wanna, from the beginning, he's saying the I'm, right, you know, number one. Well, he doesn't say atomic. That's the thing. You're confusing me with that because he talks about composites later on. Okay, it's, and he's it's talking some, about objects. Sometime later, objects. It's sometime simple, later in the text composite. where he says that's the point of atomic facts is that if you list them all and they're logically independent of one another, then you've said everything there is to say about the world. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then he says some things later about different potential arrangements when he's talking about science. We can talk this about more specifically later, but he's talking about like a scientific theory, you know, a very general one like causality or something as being an attempt to imply from certain small number of general principles, all the atomic facts. So that makes it sound to me like, and he, and he specifically says, there are different possible theories that you could put over the world to try to derive all the atomic facts from them. And the question for me then, that, that makes it sound like, it sounds very Kantian, it sounds very much like we yeah, this then can Kantian. come up with a different list. Like if, 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 the, if the point is, you just need some list of atomic facts and together they will imply the world, well then, aren't there a lot of possible arrangements of things so you could, in other words, break the atomic facts down in different ways? Uh, but the possibilities are, those are possibilities, not the actualities. No, I'm talking about the actual atomic facts, the ones that are true in our world. That I don't know that there's a, that there's one definitive list of those. I think that there are many potential definitive lists of them. It's just that depending on how you break things down, you know, if you change one atomic fact so it sort of covers a different way of picking out the world. Is you, like, would get, you would get always. He, he does seem to think, for, uh, I guess, first of all, do you think there are an infinite, are there, of, are there an infinite number of atomic facts? I don't know. <laughs> See, I think he thinks that, Seth, I there, like your, I like your that there are not. That there are not. I mean, first of all, okay, according to a system, you can't even ask the question, because you can't ask how many objects are there, because... The word object by itself doesn't make any sense. You have to be talking about. Well, you about can't do it. everything that's in so, everything that's in in the Tractatus is either <laughs> senseless or nonsense by Wittgenstein's own definition, which is why he gives that comment about taking away the latter. At the yeah. End of the, yeah. Yeah. And he knows that, but that's you know again, I don't think nonsense is a uh, pejorative term. But anyway, sorry. No, no, I just um, so Mark, I guess I'm kind of questioning what you're driving at because there's essentially an infinite number of possibilities for objects to be in combination with each other or in relation to each other, both actual. If you had to enumerate, just look in your room. Let's do a little phenomenological exercise here. If you just picked like one object in your room that you're sitting in right now and you said, okay, I'm going to describe how this one object stands in relation to every other object that's in my field of vision right now, you'd never, you'd never get to the end of it. And we're just... But it'd still be finite. It would just be very large. Right. Well, and let me, let's, let's look at this, because a lot of those descriptive points would entail each other. So even if I'm just talking about spatial relations, and I look at this computer mouse, and I say, this computer mouse is on top of the table. Well, there are all sorts of other things that are, that are under the table. So therefore... By saying it's on top of the table, I've already covered all the other spatial relationships that are of the things that are below the table, right? So there's a difference no. in fact, can, can well, something else out in the world that has to do with the table's relationship to the floor, for instance. Okay. See, this the, is what the, I'm the saying. The atomic facts maybe, would, be, would need to be like the, the atom on the, okay. yeah, I know, on but the bottom just, of the thing, above the tables, above the atom of the tables, let's just, above the atom. Let's just pretend the, for, for a minute, but, though. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to... Because I think we have fun, we've stumbled on two fundamentally different interpretations of what he means by objects, and one right. of them is is what you're talking about in terms of like they're, they're, you can't actually experience any of them. I, I want to explore this other one, which I think is what he really means, given the examples that he that he pulls out. And in fact, uh, Seth, what you described I think proves uh, my point in terms of if you think that these basic 
elements no, I don't are, think are, are a, mac- okay hold on just let me let yeah. me let me finish if you think that they are macroscopic then that would mean that there are infinitely many ways that you can pick them out or are there are there are much there are a large number of ways you could pick them out say you know if we're saying these these objects are just fictions anyway and we're just talking about you know they're posited because you list an atomic fact and so therefore it must have an object that participates in it um, well if if there are different sets of atomic facts that you in other words there are lots of different ways to describe everything in the world and he he says the atomic ones are the ones that are going to imply all the rest of them and there's and i think he thinks that there are a finite number of these again maybe maybe i'm completely wrong about that but then i think it's clear from that that you could pick out relations in the world in different ways to get a different set of basic atomic facts that will then imply the rest and that's what kind of science is doing science is trying to come up with a general theory or something that will then help us pick out a lot of specific atomic facts that will then imply everything else. But obviously there are lots of ways you can do that, lots of different, so that's why he says actually ultimately scientific things, basic things like the theory of causality, and he gives some other examples, we can look at that section, are not descriptions of the world at all. They're ways of organizing signs in the language. And that's what really made, you know, got me on this is that the, the symbology of the world is arbitrary, he says. And what that means to say, if you say the symbology of the world is arbitrary, the concepts that we use to describe things are arbitrary, that means, and, and again, you follow this representational theory that the concepts are going to reflect the states of affairs, right? the actual facts. That means how we divide the world up into facts is arbitrary. There is not one basic list of atomic facts there are many, many, many possible ones. Why not combine all those lists and say it's one list? Well, because it would be redundant. When if you, you combine all the, the different parts, lists of atomic just, facts, what I'm saying is you, if you trim have out, complete, trim out the redundant ones and then you have the list. I guess when I say, I guess I don't understand what you're saying when you say combine all the lists. Then I was talking about different lists of atomic facts, each list of which implies all the rest. So each, any one of these lists is in itself a complete description of the world. So there's no question about combining multiple lists because one list I've already said, this is the way I'm defining it, (laughs) the way he defines it, describes everything in the world. The question is, are there multiple lists or is there just one list and it's just a a matter of of how we we figure it out. If If you say there are multiple possible lists, that's a very Kantian interpretation. I think that's the, that's the charitable way to take him on this. I don't see the, the many lists, but also the, I, I didn't think it was uncontroversial that objects are simples, you know, starting with the 2.02 objects are simple, and then 2.021 objects make up the substance of the world. That is why they cannot be composite. When he says they can't be composite, he means that objects aren't things that, they're not objects in a typical sense, because they're not composite. You, you can't take an object and, and divide it up. And, right. And, well, and if, and if you define it an object with a description, then anything you can define with a description seems like you could break it down into pieces. You're right. So if I'm pointing at a rock, and we want to say, what is that object that I'm referring to? Well, I'm referring to a rock. Of course, the rock has lots of different properties. It's not logically basic. So the, the rock, the macroscopic rock, in that sense, of course, can't be the object. That's that's what you're talking about. Not, there's no but if I'm for an object. but if I'm rock saying not an object. that the only way that you can define a symbol is through demonstrative. In other words, pointing and saying that thing. I'm not giving it a description. I'm just giving it a name. That thing I'll call it A. Stands in certain relations. Then why can't that be a basic? So in other words, that because thing is related to a true. bunch of properties. For instance, it's, it's related to the properties though. of rocks. It's related to the properties of, of having spatial relations to other things. And I get your point, um, but even if you're using A as demonstrative to refer to rock, so you have a simple in that sense, your, your statement about A is still a truth function of a bunch of other statements. And when you come to atomic facts, it can't be a truth function of any other statement. Does that make sense? Why would you, why would you say that it's a truth function of a lot of others? So in other words, if I point out at a rock and I say, I just say rock. So in other words, I'm really saying that is a rock. So I'm making a relationship between what I'm positing is a simple, the statement of that thing. Is not a, is not a proposition for Wittgenstein. It's no, 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 I'm not saying, I'm not making a, I'm identifying it. And if you, if he wants to say that the world is really the field of our potential and of course actual experience, 
then that seems to be the way that you would get at the basics is in my experience right now I'm pointing at something and that is one way that I can pick out a simple and then I, I can say a lot of things about it I can say it is a rock which it, we can break it down into a lot of things it is a solid it is a you know give all the things of the, the potential colors of a rock whatever to be a rock it's though, spatiality it still has to be a, a true function of what are you going to, you know, this thing is hard and this thing has a certain atomic structure and blah, blah, blah. What are you going to do? Uh, right, so those are all the basic atomic facts. So saying I, I it is a rock. I thought this was a complete rejection of demonstratives. Also, also why, do you, why are you hi hierarchically saying that it is a rock is the molecular thing that has to be implied by simpler things like it is hard? Maybe, in fact, and I definitely read this in here, he's saying it's, it's just as valid to say it is a rock is the basic thing. And it, saying this is a rock, implies a bunch of other things. It's not that it is hard and it is thing. It implies together those make up the statement it is a rock. It's no. It's that it is a rock is the basic and that you can translate the word, the property rock, into a lot of different equivalent phrases. It's that, that, that equivalence goes but both ways. Equivalence is not hierarchical. He doesn't have, but he's explicitly against, he's against hierarchies. Like, you know, he makes this point in terms of, of numbers, like that I guess the people before him, uh, you know, wanted to define numbers in, a, in, a, in terms of, okay, once you understand one, two, three, and, and so on or something, then you, so then you can build up to higher things. Where he's saying, look, all the concepts of numbers are given to us at the same time. There's no hierarchy within numbers. But so that was a big thing. He's not saying that... You know that that there are basic a priori truths about math or about anything about reason that then we go on to derive these more complex things from. No, no, the complex things and the simple things are really sort of given all at the same time, and they all mean the same thing. This is what this referential transparency th break thing breaks down into. That if you say the the morning star is there, the evening star is there, you're saying the same thing. So the same thing if you make a very you know a bunch of simple claims about. Uh, apparent causality in the world or a global claim about this massive, you know, those are not hierarchical. It's just if, in fact, they pick out the same things and make the same claims about them, then they're substitutable for each other. There's a definite hierarchy in propositions which are truth functions of other proposition. And to say that objects are simple and that other things are complex implies a hierarchy of the more complex. Let, so let, me, let me do two things here. One is let me read some of the text that I think speaks to this. Sure. Um, so it all else fails. So if you starting on proposition 2.021, objects make up the substance of the world. That is why they cannot be composite. If the world had no substance, then whether a proposition had sense would depend on whether another proposition was true. In other words, sure. substance is the thing that guarantees that you can map a picture that it represents reality as opposed to just relying on other pictures. In that case, we could not sketch any picture of the world being true or false. It's obvious that an imagined world, however different it may be from the real one, must have something, a form, in common with it. Objects are just what constitute this unalterable form. The substance of the world can only determine a form, not any material properties. For it is only by means of propositions that material properties are represented, only by the configuration of objects that they are produced. In a manner of speaking, objects colorless. are colorless. Right. Like I said, I think of them as the variables, not as anything so, determined. Right. So, right. so I could read this one way and say all material properties of objects, and if you just talk about an object without talking about any material properties, you're not really saying anything. You're just talking about pure logical form. So you have to be using, you have to be mentioning material properties, and you have to be doing that using propositions. Otherwise, you're just talking nonsense. I could read this well, and no, say, other than, otherwise, you're just naming the thing directly. Otherwise, well, he he gets down about descriptions there later. Let me just complete this thought about hierarchy. Okay. One way to read this is to say, because all propositions are true or false, completely independent of any others, that all the facts stand alone on their own two feet, there is no hierarchy of properties. That would be one way to read this. And in fact, when we first started talking about it, and when I read it originally, I thought any proposition that represents something that's not logical, those things are all independent. And so the idea of implication and causality 
with respect to propositions that re that relate to the world doesn't really exist. And what I mean by that is, Mark, what I thought he was saying originally when I first read this was, if you say that the mouse is on the table and the table is on, the, the mouse is above the table and the table is above the footrest, let's just say. Therefore, the mouse is above the footrest. The fact that the mouse is above the footrest is made true by the actual state of affairs in the world and not by any logical connection between the idea of being on top of or above. Does that make sense? Sure. I think um, I don't. I don't let's think just, that contradicts what I was saying. I don't. I don't let's think so either. It. I'm just saying that's the way I read but it. But let's okay. just get it. Right. We still need to acknowledge what the, the hierarchy of truth functionality, which is a big part of this. Once you get to the atomic fact, you get to a fact that is no longer a function of any lower level propositions. It's no longer can no longer be decomposed. Can you give me an example so when of what you say, you're talking about? I'm having a well. That's the, that's the freaking there problem. Are no <laughs> the classic there there's been thousands and thousands of papers written about this an object is like Kant's ding on sich it's the it's the object equals x i totally agree with you it is Kant's ding on sich objects are the substance that guarantee that the world is not completely fluid and totally changeable all the time and has some kind of form that we can represent and actually get along with right that's a great way of putting it okay great more importantly is the fact that he's repeat, like saying... Repeat that one more time. Repeat that one more time. Objects are simply the substance that guarantee that the world has some kind of form or structure, that it's not constantly fluid and changeable and, and mutable, such that we can represent it and represent it accurately. Or represent yes, it, and represent and it and at all. The question, are the objects something... Are the logic uh, objects something the basic object something that are that's actually in the world, or is it something that we impose and therefore we can do it in a lot of different ways? Well, remember so that I buy. So what Wes said about we in a given system of symbology, you're going to have basic atomic facts, and then you're going to have the compounds of those. So let's say your atomic fact is represented by P, and another atomic fact is represented by Q. Well, of course you have. P and Q. Right. Okay, there's a molecular proposition right there. Exactly. Now, the question is, though, so, of course, yes, if you establish that, that there's a set of atomic facts, and, again, they're supposed to imply the rest of the facts. There are infinitely many different ways of putting these things together, or at, at least, if not infinite, very, very large. So, so there's a question, okay, yes, you have a hierarchy once you've established what the basic ones are, but the question is, are what the basic ones are given by the world? Or are there different things that one could focus on in coming up with your basic concepts? And then once you come up with those basic concepts, and therefore your set of atomic propositions, your atomic facts, which are represented by atomic propositions, you could get a different way of equally validly symbolizing everything that there is, but you're picking out different elements, because nature itself does not imply what those individual elements are going to be. But those, those facts are the, are the world. They're not our ways of picking them out. Yes. If we go back to the beginning, the world is the totality of facts, not of things. So it's just when you think about how, how you would describe a particular situation, there are so many different facts. I mean, it seems to us absolutely. that there are infinitely many ways of describing a situation. And that, to me, does not reflect the fact that there are an infinite number in any given symbology that there are an infinite number of atomic facts about this situation. It means there's, there are infinitely many approaches you could use to starting to carve up the world into atomic facts and then the rest of the things that are derived from them. Do you guys remember studying definite descriptions? Let me, let me give you an example. So we have, on the one hand, we have the world being the totality of facts. And a fact, yeah. a, a, a fact is like an atomic proposition about the state of relations of two objects in the world. And all of these things are equal. They're all equally true or equal. What does that mean? All the, though? all the atomic facts, it means because they're logically independent of each other, there's no reason to, to make any, hierarchically arrange them in any way. Yeah. The, 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 right. the truth of the statement that Seth is 41 years old and the truth of the statement that there are four books on the floor near this desk, the truth values are equivalent. Oh, I see. Do you guys have carpet in the rooms that you're in right now? Yes. Okay. If I take one individual strand and I say, okay, here's a fact. This strand is 
touching this other strand that's right next to it. And this strand is also a millimeter away from the strand that's on the other side of that strand that it's touching. And it's a millimeter and a half away from the next strand, and, and so on and so forth. I could create a, a totality of facts just about my carpet that would take me years to enumerate. Yep. And those are right. facts that make up the, the structure of the world that I have to acknowledge according to Wittgenstein's... But they're not atomic. Why are they not atomic? Because they're, they're reducible to other... Well, that's the that's the question. I, is, is, I don't think they're, they're then, not. Let's, let's make it's, this only it's a true. It's a true statement about the world that 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 that. But it's, of, it's true, but the most true statements are reducible to other. They're truth functional. They depend upon the truth of other problems. I mean, that's what, what all the, the, the truth. Of, well, the truth of this is, statement most, does not depend on anything other than the fact that the, the state of affairs holds in the world. The fact but it that does the, depend the, on other. The fact that it, these two things stand in that relation to each other is what makes my proposition true. I agree. But, I think that's. Uh, no. and, and, but it does. It does obviously imply from that that right. there you, are you a have to acknowledge ways. it's truth functional, right? They depend on that. There are other. Th those aren't windowless. Those those have truth functional relationships to other propositions. Even the even the atomic facts. Your strand. Like listen, strand of the carpet being to the left or right of another strand, or this or that, or. Having a color is truth functionally related to molecule. statement about an, a molecule and many molecules. There are many well, facts about molecules which, if one of those facts about those molecules weren't true, or a number of those okay. facts, then you would have a different result for the let, overall let me, fact. So, as as truth functional, they cannot be. A let me let me wait a second. Let me see if I understand what you're saying, Wes. So, the fact that the strand of the carpet sits to the left of another strand is dependent upon the fact that a molecule that makes up the first strand stands to the left of a molecule that makes up the second. Take all the molecules in the strand. Molecule A stands to the left, molecule B stands to the left, molecule C stands to the left, plus molecule A is part of it, and blah, blah, blah. There are many, there are millions and millions of facts that just go into the one strand being to the left. So... Am I wrong about well, that? Or? No, but I mean, the, the statement... Uh, but according to Wittgenstein, the fact that the proposition, the picture, the logical picture is of the strand standing in relation to the other strand, and that has truth or falsity. In fact, it's true because the state of affairs hold. And I can make that. Right, I can you make don't that, need to know anything. I don't need to know anything else about, about the molecules to to affirm exactly. So this is this is my point of why it is. But, but we're relative. talking about two different things now. We're talking about the relationships between. <laughs> Macroscopic facts, and then the other facts. But that's the question. To, do, with, do the, with which do the these truth is related, and then to... we're talking about picturing. The, those are two different things. The relationship between the picture and the fact that you're, you, the pictures. Oftentimes, you're making pictures of non-atomic facts. That's granted. That doesn't mean that the non-atomic facts of which you're making pictures aren't truth, aren't still non-atomic. We're not making pictures of atomic facts as human beings. Despite the fact that he says we make pictures of atomic facts. Where? <laughs> I'm willing to admit I'm wrong, believe me. Okay. Well, Where does he say I, that? Let's, let's just clarify one more time what these interpretations are and then move on to something else, because I think some people are probably really agonized by this point. I know, <laughs> I know you're right. right. We, we understand very clearly, Wes, what your position is that these atomic facts are not observable because all the basic things are things below the level of perception. My claim to counter that was that no, atomic facts do stand in truth functional relationships to other things. You know, so the, if P is an atomic fact, it stands in a truth functional relationship to P and Q. It's just that P is the basic one. So the question is, is it just an arbitrary matter of, of how we make signs to represent the world, which ones are going to be the basic ones and which are not. I could start a system that is going to describe the world, which is based on these thoughts, that is at the level of macroscopic objects. For instance, that carpet strand, I think the example Seth gave was very intuitively right on what it sounds like he is talking about. And in that system, the, the basic atomic fact is going to be the things about the individual carpet strands. Derived from that, we can say some things about the carpet strands, like it is composed of molecules. 
composed of doesn't mean the smaller things are somehow more basic than the it's large true. things. That they're all it's truth functional. Though. It's not composition. It's not myriology. It's truth functional. So you can show me how they're not truth functionally related. How of, I'm, I'm facts saying, cannot of, be of course they're related, related but to any other which fact. direction are they related in? Is the question. I would say it's not that the individual, the truths about the individual positions of the molecules then imply a truth about the position of the macroscopic object. It's the other way around. It's the position of the macroscopic object implies, entails a lot of things about the truths of the molecules because we know that it is composed of molecules, so that's a bunch of atomic facts, or sorry, a bunch of facts about it. And that because we've already said as an atomic fact it's in this position, then that's going to imply a whole lot of things about those individual molecules. Why why right. say the things Can about I, the molecules are the basic ones instead of the macroscopic? Because the molecules it seems are it's arbitrary. Let's take a set of statements about molecules. Can you say the the statement about the specific molecule is a function of the statement about the fabric? About the atoms? I mean, you can keep going about the quarks, about the lepton. Yeah, you know. it's about the atoms. Yeah, right. I'm not. I'm saying the molecules and it isn't atomic either. It's just more atomic than. Right, but there's never going to be. If you're judging based on composition, there's never going to be a level that you have to call basic. So, if that's the case, you, that's a reductio ad absurdum against what you're saying. You have to make the the basic somewhere else, or else that you could make it anywhere. Is really the point. All right. I think I think, I think I, we've established our competing I understand, positions, but I and we should see stop. a lot of. Okay. <laughs> do you agree, Seth? You understand both of our positions here? Yes, I I do. I still think I'm that you're in, saying so. in in the matter of atomic facts, it's Mark and Seth against Wes. I think Mark and I are agreed on this one, Wes. I'm sorry. It's not a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we had a little break there. We had some technical difficulties, and we kind of ran out of time for the evening. So it's been nine days or so since uh, the first part of our discussion of logical atomism, the term that Wittgenstein never actually uses. And we took the opportunity to do a little research to try to figure out what the proper interpretation of uh, his uh, atomic facts was. Wes, do you want to start? Yeah, and I don't think it's... Proper or not proper, I think this has been a confusing issue for decades now, and there's been a whole cottage industry of trying to figure out what atomic facts are and what Russell meant by it versus what Wittgenstein meant by it. Why don't we explain who Russell is since you brought this up? So Bertrand Russell was uh, one of Wittgenstein's teachers, right? Wittgenstein sought him out after working with uh, Gottlieb Frege that we talked a little about last time. And so he thanks Russell... Says, says near the beginning of the book, How far my efforts agree with those of other philosophers, I will not decide. Indeed, what I have written here makes no claim to novelty in points of detail, and therefore I will give no sources because indifferent to me whether what I have thought has already been thought before me by another. <laughs> I admire the balls of that. But then he does go on to say, yeah, but it does owe a lot to Frege and Russell. So it was supposed to be you know, pretty directly influenced by Russell and responding to some of, uh, I know you talked last time about Russell's definite descriptions and some other parts of Russell's theory, and was trying to make corrections to some parts of Russell's theory of mathematics as presented in the Principia Mathematica, a very long and probably very boring book that I have (laughs) only read summaries of. Full of symbolic logic notation. Yes. But then Russell was very impressed by the Tractatus, and it seems like it's only his fault that it got published at all. And Russell wrote the introduction, and even though Wittgenstein apparently didn't really like his introduction that much and thought he misunderstood some things, the only way he could get it published was to, to use that introduction. Yeah. So uh, and they, they had an ongoing discussion, and then, of course, Wittgenstein eventually rejected a lot of the things that he had put into the Tractatus as well. Uh, right. But, not to uh, mention the Russellian position, but yeah. Right, but Russell was one of the people that ran with the Tractatus or with the logical atomism, which was an idea that he'd already been playing around with before the Tractatus came up, but he liked Wittgenstein's version of it. And so we're going to post a link with this to Russell's logical atomism lectures. It's just a pretty short PDF that uh, some some lectures he gave in, in uh, 1918. So, and the Tractatus is what year? He wrote it in the trenches of World right, War I. He wrote I. it while fighting um, and then while a prisoner of war. Right. That was pretty interesting. And Russell says in this thing that what what he's proposing in these logical atomism lectures owes itself a lot to Wittgenstein, 
But you shouldn't hold Wittgenstein responsible because, in fact, at that point, he didn't know if Wittgenstein was living or dead, he says. <laughs> so, In Russell's diaries, there's an account of when he first meets Wittgenstein, and it's just really, like, this guy is weird and obnoxious. And then later on, when he's changed his opinion, it's a funny contrast. It's like, oh, well, he turned out to be a genius. So being weird and obnoxious should be a clue that someone is a genius. You should assume that everyone is <laughs> right, obnoxious right. that you meet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't think that logically <laughs> follows. <laughs> it's an atomic fact, man. So we talked about atomic facts and Wittgenstein's idea, basically, that propositions can be analyzed into more elementary propositions, and those propositions correspond to facts, which can be analyzed into more elementary facts until you get to the end of that analysis, and at the end of that you have an atomic state of affairs or atomic fact and then an atomic proposition that corresponds to that these atomic facts are combinations of objects and those objects he calls simple and one of the characteristics of those facts is that they cannot be logically connected in any way with other atomic so, facts for instance of course, no, with other facts with other atomic, atomic facts course, right. right they cannot be dependent in the sense of one atomic fact following as a logical conclusion from another or contradicting another. They're all completely logically independent of each other. Wittgenstein's idea is that there's no such thing as physical necessity, that everything can be reduced to this logical necessity, so that, for instance, this analysis is its always a logical analysis, as you pointed out before, Mark. It's not a physical analysis into parts, it's a logical analysis into more and more simple logical elements, which is not to say that they can't have something to do with each other. So, for instance, if I name something like a rock, part of the idea, and this is Russell's idea, that Wittgenstein goes with the definite descriptions, naming something like a rock, the name can actually just be a substitute for other propositions. So it's a complex which is related sure. to other propositions. Those propositions are logically related, so they're definitional, they're a matter of meaning. You know, when I say rock, what do I mean? So they could be a list of properties, and if you're a scientist, it may have something to do with the constituents. So it's not that the analysis of meaning or the conceptual analysis is always unrelated to the, let's say, physical analysis into constituents. It's just that it doesn't have to be. And Ultimately, Wittgenstein wants to get you to the point where everything flows out of the logic. It's not a matter of physics anymore. Physics is just a higher up level of these atomic facts and these logic of the world. All right. So one of the interpretations of this is the idea that, let's quote Russell here in his introduction. This is sort of a good summary. A fact which has no parts that are facts is called by Mr. Wittgenstein a Sachverhalt. You have to help me, Seth. Sachverhalt. Sach, Sachverhalt. This is the same thing that he calls an atomic fact. An atomic fact, although it contains no parts that are facts, nevertheless does contain parts. If we may regard Socrates as wise as an atomic fact, when he says that, it, of course, it's not really an atomic fact. It's just treating it as such for the purposes of argument. If we may regard that as an atomic fact, we perceive that it contains the constituents Socrates and wise. If an atomic fact is analyzed as fully as possible, theoretical, not practically possible, is meant, the constituents finally reached may be called simples or objects. It is a lot of logical necessity demanded by theory, like an electron. His ground for maintaining that there must be simples is that every complex presupposes a fact, and then you can go on from there. So one of the interpretations in the, the is that in, this in the idea introduction to of... The Factatus that right. Russell wrote. So I think Russell plays around with these different ideas. One of them is that these simples or objects are theoretical entities that you can't ever really define. It's ambiguous. Actually, I did some research in, in his notebooks. He plays around, for instance, as did Russell later on, with the idea that these objects could be, say, a colored point in a visual field, something like that. But he later on rejects this, and there are some interesting reasons why that has to be rejected. So Wittgenstein was confused and Russell was confused as well. In fact, they agreed later on they'd worry about what these objects were and what these atomic facts were. Now, Mark, you had another way of looking at this where the simples may be theoretical entities that can't be identified, but the atomic well, that's, facts... Well, that's why he says the, there the, may the be facts, something the facts like an empirical example. He thinks are the 
minimal unit that we can get down to, that the simples themselves, the objects that are joined together in the atomic facts don't make any sense by themselves. We can only even understand them in the context of a fact, which makes more sense to me when you're talking about the X, the substance that is green or whatever, than uh, a property. You know, previous to is going to be, I would say, a pretty basic property relation. Like, what are you going to analyze that into? So if you include properties as well as the nouns, which it seems at least some of the time Wittgenstein thought you should too as these symbols, then at least those kind of make sense to me in terms of uh, breaking things down into their basics and yet still being able to understand what the components are. But it is a fact-based metaphysics. It's not an object-based metaphysics. You don't list all the objects and say that's what there is. That's exactly the kind of metaphysics that he's rejecting. So that's, I guess, how I wanted us to, you know, once we were a little clearer about uh, what these two views were. So Russell in the Logical Atomism lectures specifically says the particulars he has in mind are little patches of color and sounds, momentary things, and also predicates or relations and so on. He really wants to run with this, Russell does, as a metaphysical theory. And since we have to cut off because we ran way long in our discussion of the Tractatus, this seemed like a good place to cut it off with this discussion of what if this fact-based metaphysics is actually a metaphysical theory, which at least for Russell, it was. And if a text is too obscure, find someone who's influenced by that text who is clearer. <laughs> So that's kind of what, in throwing out this extra Russell reading is, is what I had in mind and is what I clearly had in mind when I was raising last time the idea that these were uh, something that we could understand. Although I still think in Wittgenstein, it is peculiar that he says stuff like the world is you know, coextensive with my experience of the world, right? And then yet the basic components of his world, these atomic facts, are things that somehow we can't have any perception of because all you know regular facts that we run into are somehow you can use this analysis to get down to something more basic so I, you know maybe Wittgenstein is just incoherent yeah. about that I'm or vague at least yeah his notebooks show yes. that he's of two minds he doesn't know whether or not atomic facts can be thought of yep. as something that you could give an example of that it's so if Russell so in particular before he met Wittgenstein even, was interested in this logical atomism as metaphysical pluralism. And he was reacting to the Hegelians like F.H. Bradley, who I've only heard of in this context, <laughs> as somebody Russell was reacting against. Hegelians. Oh, yeah. Hegelians. Hegelians. Hegel um, Hegelianos, German, I'm going to say. German snob. Russell was a Hegelian, is that the right pronunciation? And had his awakening and went to the other extreme. So Bradley yes. was the so, English Hegel. According to this, maybe probably very oversimplified version of Hegel, who we'll talk about at some point, everything underlyingly is one substance, right? All dualities dissolve upon further reflection, which sounds very Taoist or Buddhist or something to me. And just to give some of the motivation for that, one of the things that Bradley was worried about, and, and Russell will continue to worry about this, is relational properties where if you say there are two objects and then you say there's this third thing, the relation between them, and you think that there has to be some truth bearer or something in the metaphysics that corresponds to that relation in order to give it truth, then you have to ask, well, what connects the relation entity to each of the things that it relates? There has to be another connection, and then you get this infinite regress, and therefore everything right. and is And we saw that in Leibniz to too, with. right? So. Just to name drop again. Well, would, that everything. Well, he's all about everything the, he's all is about a the reflection, relations, yeah. a microcosmic reflection of everything else. That we are all, in effect, aspects of God. Right. There's a famous Latin phrase that Leibniz uses a lot. I think it's predicatum in est subjecto. All the predicates are in the subject. That's the logical version of this idea of everything being in the monad, and that includes relational properties, which. Arguably, Wittgenstein is doing right, something Right, because he says that similar. stuff like, uh, if I understand an object, I understand all the possible relationships it can have. Right. Which led us to the question of, can you ever understand an well, object? Well, even, even that, yeah, it's unclear to me whether he was talking about the simples there or any object, even if it's ultimately analyzable in terms of more logically basic objects. Like, if I understand this book in front of me, I understand that it is a spatial thing that can sit on other spatial things. Like, there's all these potential facts about its location about like how how hot it is about right. that i understand about it 
So I think he was talking about right. even macroscopic objects with that. And that sure right. sounds like the potential yeah, it's relationships just that the, are, are yeah. in the thing itself. So Russell in particular was reacting against this monism by saying, in the world, there really are multiple things, like indivisibly multiple things, these atomic facts or whatever. The interpretation that I gave, which I, I admit is not Wittgenstein's, but is a possible thing you could read out of it, which is, well, why say that there's a particular set of atomic facts if really there's just reality out there and what these atomic facts are just elements of description, then it seems like you could carve it up in any old way. But that's a very modest view and therefore this kind of relativistic, you know, that you could come up with a plurality of analyses of this, which is directly against Russell's view that basically there are multiple things. Let's just close this out by saying if there is anything to say, I mean, what do you actually think Let's start with you, Seth. What do you think about this fact-based metaphysics? Does this like have any appeal to you at all? Either version. Yes, it does have some appeal to me because I like the idea that he's locating the center or the grounding of the metaphysics in the same place where you find meaning. So instead of a kind of hollow talk about what is and what isn't and getting caught up in the question of existence or non-existence. He's sort of relocating the focus for the metaphysical discussion. And I'm the kind of person that can just take a simple on faith. I can have a thing, you know, a thing in itself, and I'm okay with that. And, you know, given that I'm a Heideggerian in my sympathies, even though I think Heidegger is much more elegant and deep and important than Wittgenstein, there is a kind of phenomenological bent to this approach even though it got taken in the direction of language and so forth, that allows you to kind of do the same kind of explorations about experience that I find more attractive. That's the way I would read it in order to enjoy it myself. What do you think, Wes? I like it. I like it a lot better than I did in graduate school. I remember being bored to tears by Russell and Wittgenstein. And it, I feel like I understand it so much better, too. It was just baffling to me. And now, for whatever reason, I guess, you know, you go out in the corporate world for a while and you come back to it and uh, it seems a lot clearer. I like it, you know, and especially after reading Leibniz, I like um, some of the similarities there, the sort of logical version of that. And then now I, I see some of the similarities to Kant as well. This idea of taking language and taking logic and trying to derive these metaphysical implications from it, basically. What must be the nature of the world such that it grounds the way we speak about it in a certain mm -hmm. way. So, yeah, it has a lot of appeal to me. I don't think it's clearer to, <laughs> to me. I thought I had a clear understanding of it when I read it the first time in my actual Wittgenstein class, and we went through this very, very carefully. And I like the idea. One of, one of the other translations for Zachverhalt's atomic fact is state of affairs. And I like that better, that there's just the state of the world. But that doesn't sound like pluralism when I think of it that way. Whereas it's clear if you read more that you're supposed to be able to sort of, even if there's infinitely many atomic facts, there's a lower order of infinity of atomic facts than other kinds of facts. And uh, just the, the idea of, unless you're talking about some kind of relativistic system like I was talking about before, or you know where you can sort of start with any arbitrary set of these atomic facts and build the rest of the facts, it seems a little artificial to me. It seems just as artificial as, you know, the atoms in a void thing that he was kind of arguing against. Mm. So I, I guess I'm a monist at heart. I like thinking of process as fundamental as opposed to substance, right? Because at least that doesn't deny the reality of change, right? You're not, you don't become a Platonist in thinking that you have to have uh, something unchangeable to be perfect, so I, I have, in general, a sympathy with this talking about facts instead of talking about things. But I don't find Wittgenstein's particular account of this very illuminating, and I think he didn't mean to be illuminating about it, because, as we will talk about in the next discussion, he was ultimately against metaphysics. And like you're saying, that just this basic sort of what he would consider common sense are just the outline of a metaphysics that flows from what he really wants to talk about, which is logic and its relation to speech. Yeah. And I should say, I don't think the atomism, I'm not a logical atomist at heart in the sense that I think that he solves the problems he's trying to solve. In a way, they're trying to dissolve those sorts of problems that lead one to become an idealist or lead one to become a monist. And, of course, 
as usual, it's a failed project, as <laughs> usual for any philosophical project, but it does put those problems into a much crisper light, let's put it that way, <laughs> let's say a much more atomistic light than one might otherwise have had. And then this idea of reducing the world to logic is pretty crazy if you think about it. Even physical necessity well, ends it up doesn't becoming logical reduce, necessity. I think we'll talk about science next time. I don't think it reduces... I think he makes a very clear distinction between it reduces speech to, at least if if speech were well-formed, to logic, but not the world itself, right? I that's, mean... That's the whole point that he's making this distinction between a representation... But, well, the connections between the facts are logical. Now, whatever sure. you want to say of what that means ontologically, that's difficult, but those are still relations between facts, and facts are ontological elements. So, all right. All right. All right. so that's about all the time we have for discussing the metaphysics, for discussing this part of the Tractatus. Tune in to the next episode, where we will discuss the rest of the Tractatus, and we'll throw in a little Rudolf Carnap, a logical positivist, part of a school that was highly influenced by the part of the Tractatus that said, you can't sensibly talk about the kind of things that philosophy talks about. So, uh, last time we talked about Wittgenstein's picture of reality as made up of facts and propositions being pictures of facts. So logic is the practice of ordering propositions, making their relations to each other clear. The propositions of logic are not actually supposed to be informative, right? He seems to think that a lot of the things that we might think are substantial claims about the world, like saying something is identical to itself. You're just making a stupid point about logic that is really very uninformative. In fact, even the informative sounding laws of logic, right? Like modus ponens, if A and if A then B, therefore B, they don't actually say anything about the world. They are senseless. They have no informational content. They only describe the language itself, not the world. So he's divided things that we could say as being either things about the world, which are parts of science, or things about language itself, which are parts of logic. And really, we should work towards an ideal language. This is Leibniz's project, where he wanted to maybe replace natural language with a logically transparent language. So all of the analysis of the different propositions would just be obvious. And a lot of what philosophy then is going to be doing with natural language is just turning it into that kind of language by making the logical relationships between our concepts clear. And those are the only two really legitimate things to talk about. Talk about the world or talk about language itself, logic itself. And if you're talking about anything that is not a potential object of experience, right, a thing in the world, if you're talking about, say, reality as a whole, as philosophers like to do, if you're talking about ethics, he picks out as being something over and above, things about the world that can be described, and all these other things that philosophy seem concerned with, our words just don't refer to anything. They're nonsense. So I think the key point for this to me is his very impoverished notion of what constitutes a state of affairs, which seems to be very uh, experiential, but experiential with a strong, strong, strong bias towards sensation, by which I mean visual and presumably auditory and so forth sensation. So the proposition, Seth is further south on the globe than Mark is true. And that state of affairs holds in such a way that we can talk about it and it has meaning. And so we can say something meaningful about that. Then we can say, well, Seth is north of Wes, and that's false. So for him, that's useful ways to talk about it. And presumably all of the propositions of science are kind of like that. Bodies of greater density act differently than bodies of lesser density or, you know, a liquid with higher density sinks below a liquid of lesser density or something along those lines. And he says, that's okay. And then, like you said, you have the propositions about language, which are logical. But what it sounds to me like he's saying is the sentence, Seth is more righteous than Mark, that state of affairs doesn't exist or the term righteous is meaningless. And so that statement has no meaning, and so he rules it out. Is that a fair... Yeah, as empirically unverifiable. Your emotions and your state of mind are empirically unverifiable. Yes, and I think in addition to being completely insane <laughs> to say anything like that, it's ridiculous because, I mean, I haven't gone through the exercise of trying to find an empirically identifiable fact that also contains a moral judgment that would take it outside of the realm, but if I said something like, 
Seth is a more moral human being than Jeffrey Dahmer. Is there anybody in the world that would dispute that fact? Is there anybody who would say that that state of affairs was not true? Well, if you recast that in a purely descriptive way, that is, there are groups of actions that people call moral. And not to say they are moral, but people call them. And because there's this general consensus on what actions people consider moral, so in other words, we're just talking about what people's opinions are. We're not saying what the truth of the matter is. Then, yeah, it's like saying that song is rock music and that song is jazz because people have developed pretty standard, you know, at least in some cases, you can make those categorical decisions. I mean, you can interpret it in the same way. Or as an Aristotelian, you might want to relate morality back to health and so on and so forth. But I think the stronger argument here has to do with talking about mental states, and I think that sort of encompasses the moral part. Okay, so here's kind of my two criticisms of this. The first is, it's not clear to me that all empirically verifiable states of affairs are as completely boring and pointless as the ones that he uses in his examples, and that for the most part are used in examples in 20th century analytic right. philosophy. Do you remember spending hours and hours with the cat? I was just about to say that. <laughs> okay. And, oh, I see a field of green and there is a point in it. And I yeah. mean, so for you to say that I cannot describe a state of affairs that's empirically verifiable, that contains any kind of meaning that extends beyond the realm of physical science. First of all, I question whether that's true. The second thing is, Oh my God, what in the world would we be doing if all we did was talk about physical facts, <laughs> empirically verifiable physical facts, and the logic of language? I mean, if that were the pursuit of philosophy that you just spent your time pointing out how when people said interesting things about literature and philosophy and <laughs> ethics and all that was that you were caught up in a grammar mistake, <laughs> there would be no point in pursuing that's this. Awesome. And that's kind of like my huge bone to pick with this. So Wittgenstein was convinced he was right, and he was an insanely arrogant guy <laughs> in that respect. But what was the motivation? What could possibly motivate you to say, yeah, there's really no purpose in talking about anything that's interesting. Let's just turn the world over to Niels Bohr and his colleagues and then sit around jerking off. It's, <laughs> it's nightmarish. See, I think Wittgenstein, though, is less like that than than Carnap, because there's a lot of philosophical beauty. Yes, he became to, less like Well, that. no, but also even to the Tractatus, I think there's some cool metaphysical stuff going on. But I, I totally agree with you, Seth. And I think just to bring out this classic problem is that this principle of verifiability is, of course, not verifiable. Yeah, let's back up it's and give empirical. the relation of uh, Carnap and verificationism to the Tractatus here. Okay. So like we we're saying, the Vienna Circle... Logical positivists really took the Tractatus. They had some of these ideas floating around before the Tractatus, but they really liked the Tractatus and took this as a signal to declare war on metaphysics. And so the Carnap reading that we have provided a link to, he interprets Wittgenstein's main point here as saying that the function of philosophy is logical analysis of propositions, right? To show the logical relations between them. And one of the key parts of that maybe the whole thing is to find the verification for the proposition. The way he says it is what reason do we have to assert that is true? So we can verify this either directly through perception or much more likely indirectly. And here's a quote, a proposition P, which is not directly verifiable can only be verified by direct verification of propositions deduced from P together with other already verified propositions. So he gives a example about if you're trying to determine if a key is made of iron well, you do tests on it. You might not be able to just verify that it's iron, but you can do tests on it. So is it attracted by a magnet? You could do mechanical, chemical, optical tests. At each point, we know that iron is supposed to yield a certain result with the test, so at least it has a chance of failing. You might not conclusively be able to prove that it is iron, but you can get a better and better and better idea. But it's really saying that what this is iron means is it will pass all these different tests. Right? It will show itself to have the same properties as things that we have determined to be iron. And so he thinks that you should be able to do that with everything. And so if you say uh, there's a god and you can't tell me which observations that's supposed to give rise to, right? what tests you could put to it, 
then it's meaningless, right? If it doesn't have a verification, either direct or possible indirect, it's a meaningless concept. And the, I think the problem is that it's not just God. It would be anything philosophical, including sure. the principle of verifiability. There's nothing that you can do to empirically verify that principle. You can give no argument for the principle of verifiability except that it makes you comfortable because all the philosophical problems that worried you, you no longer have to think about, right? It tidies things up. Yeah, if you're a system builder, if your concern is, how do I create a complete closed system and tie up all the loose ends and, and all that stuff? I'll go back to my point that I'm not sure the purpose of philosophical activity is to be a system builder, you know, even though there have been plenty of people that do that. It certainly misses the point of Wittgenstein, who was not trying to build a system. Yeah. At least I don't think he was here. And also, there are things that have, uh, like, for instance, the concept of God fulfills some conceptual role. It may do so illegitimately, but there's some problem that it's addressing and there's some motivation beyond a mere mistake in grammar. But again, I, I just think that the biggest problem with this, and I think the reason why it was ultimately abandoned, is that inevitably we make these philosophical and in the technical sense meaningless statements because whenever we make second level observations, in other words, whenever we are reflective and turn the mind back on itself, for instance, or language, whenever we try to talk about language or talk about relations, you know, it comes back to the ontological problem of relations that we were talking about with Bradley. Anytime you're talking about something formal, it shows itself, as Wittgenstein said, and as showing itself as being structure, you're going to fall into a whole lot of philosophical problems every time you try and treat form or structure as yet another object. So the idea is we have to avoid treating that as an object within our language, and any talk about that becomes meaningless. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself into philosophical problems. And I think the motivation for that, which is the avoidance of philosophical problems, is not strong enough to justify it. Obviously, you can't empirically justify creating these suppositions and rules to avoid those problems. And I think, again, other than that, the only other argument you can give for it is that, well, the world must make sense and we must be able to make sense of it completely. I don't know if that made sense, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like I'm on the periphery of this. Like, I'm not taking it head on, that I'm just a little bit angry about it. So I'd like to try to understand and give a charitable reading and then, you know, provide some kind of criticism of it. But I'm totally with you. I'm I get so angry about this stuff. Well, I get as angry about this stuff as I do about relativism. So Mark, you're gonna have to be the sober one. I do I sympathize with first Wittgenstein's argument really against making any universal claims. That's the foundation of system building and, you know, right from Plato talking about the forms and stuff, the philosophy seems saying everything is water is like one of the examples that Carnap gave from ancient Greek philosophy. And how do you argue between everything is water and no, everything is the void? Actually, well, though, isn't that an example of an empirical proposition that doesn't count as meaningless? <laughs> Seriously. How so? I think he was giving that, he, he was saying that as ambitious or as absurd as those... Let's, let's read the actual... No, 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 no. He's, I'm probably he's, wrong about this. Let's just, let's just read it. I do not include in metaphysical those theories, sometimes called metaphysical, whose object is to arrange the most general propositions of the various regions of scientific knowledge in a well-ordered system. But that's not... Uh, everything is water is not in that part. That's empirically verifiable, though. It's not metaphysical. You can test whether or not the world is made of water. Not if it's underlyingly made of water. Very famously, Plato came along and said that these sorts of quasi-philosophical and yet materialistic theories, because they're still essentially materialistic, and in that sense, you're dealing with something, you know, saying the world is made of, up of ideas in the platonic sense is dealing with something which I think of as unverifiable. Saying that it's made of water seems in a different category. Here's the quote. Now let us examine this kind of proposition, that is the metaphysical proposition, from the point of view of verifiability. It is easy to realize that such propositions are not verifiable. From the proposition, the principle of the world is water, we are not able to deduce any proposition asserting any perceptions or feelings or experiences, whatever, which may be expected for the future. Therefore, the proposition, the principle of the world is water, asserts nothing at all. 
Yeah, I see what he's uh, saying. I think it's a bad example. I don't think it's very charitable to say that he's trying to say the entire world is understandable. It's that there are limits. I, this seems almost more Kantian to say there are limits to the th- kinds of things that we could understand. Yeah, but the difference is, and this is the difference with Kant, that, you know, as a strong Kantian, as is probably obvious by now, I absolutely agree with that. But Kant is very careful to say you cannot talk about God, for instance, or freedom or soul as an object of science, and you get into huge problems with that. It's sort of Kant's version of the grammar mistake. If you treat the soul as an object that will behave as an empirical object and as something out there in the world to be examined, you'll get all sorts of errors. But that doesn't mean you can't talk about the soul, and that doesn't mean that you can't have rational thought about the soul. Kant distinguishes thought and knowledge. So it's just a matter of understanding the difference between those two activities, yet defining science and cordoning it off from the metaphysical, I think, is an important enterprise. But saying that that means that metaphysics is completely illegitimate, I think, is the step that I reject. Here, here. Well, I mean, isn't it just tied to that Cartesian desire for certainty, right, that we don't want to call anything knowledge at all unless it is certain knowledge, unless it is clear and distinct. And so that their interpretation of that is empiricist. In fact, he quotes uh, Hume somewhere in here. Can I give the, the quote from Hume? It seems to me that the only objects of the abstract sciences are of demonstration are quantity and number. All other inquiries of men regard only matter of fact and existence, and these are evidently incapable of demonstration. When we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. (laughs) Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Mr. That's, Grinch. That's, that's a quote from Carnap? From, it's in the Carnap, but it's a quote from Hume from Inquiry Concerning ah, Human Understanding. Okay. So, you know, I give Hume the benefit of the doubt, but not Carnap. Because Hume at least was... And Kant was very motivated clever. by that. Humean skepticism, but as Kant phrases it, he finds a way to preserve faith. And, well, Hume creates problems even for science. And I think that's what Kant thought. Because Hume debunks even causality. Um, yes. I think that's why he must be. For that yeah. yeah, that's Maybe why he must talk be talking about... about quantity and number there. And so Kant wants to get back causality, and he wants to save physics, for instance, and other things. He didn't think Hume saw the full implications of his skepticism, and he thought it would destroy science as well as metaphysics. So he thought he would get back science by providing a ground for causality, for instance. Right. Other... So the the famous part of Hume that I. Th- think you're referring to is Hume says, what is causality? Why do we think that one thing causes another? Well, just because we see one thing and then we see another thing coming right after it. It's just proximity. And then it seems like the same things kind of happen in proximity all the time, but we don't actually see the causation. If one billiard ball hits another billiard ball, you know, we see one moving, we see it stop, we see another start. We can make some generalizations about the description of, you know, how that tends to happen. And so it seems like we can come up with uh, these inductive, descriptive, you could call them laws, but there's nothing necessary about them. It's just contiguity, right? Well, I I mean, Hume says explicitly, this is like memory and experience. He says, every day of your life, you've woken up, the sun has risen. So you expect that tomorrow when you wake up, the sun's going to rise too. That is in no way, shape or form necessary. It's just your blind faith based on what has happened in the past. And the billiard balls fall in the same category. Yeah, you've seen it happen before. Yeah. And that leads to people doing psychological experiments with babies and <laughs> crashing billiard balls into them. <laughs> exactly. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Somebody like did a billiard ball experiment with babies and decided that at a certain age, the babies start to cry when you run the ball into another and they both just stop instead of seeing the motion that's supposed to be there. And they so they said something like at six months, that's when human beings get the concept of causality huh. because these babies started crying when the ball didn't All right. go straight. Actually, that does sound familiar now when you started describing them like what they put the babies on the table and they, they <laughs> hit them with billiard balls. That's what I thought you were talking that is, about. That is not nice. No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this was an experiment that somebody did to try to show... Yep when people developed the idea of causality, which was the biggest load of hokum I've ever heard. (laughs) One way of explaining this Humean point is to say that we may have perceptions of color 
there's a physical organ which helps us have sensations of color, but there's no organ which sort of takes in causality on the whole out of the world. This is, again, the problem of form. There's no organ of intuition that sucks in the form from the world. The form is sort of something that we have to, we might say, mentally construct. So all you get are these sequences of sensations, or, you know, Mark was talking about contiguity and so on and so forth and to make sense of them by talking about causality is not to talk about anything that you could say corresponds to an object in the world and therefore you know again you get this sense that it's meaningless so for Kant he wants to get back causality and the only way he can do that is to say that it's a category of the mind which the world already includes where you reconceptualize the world as something that is already has the mental activity baked into it. So the world outside of that is this unavailable thing in itself where all those categories of space and time, they're no longer legitimate. And then the world that the mind stamps with its own categories, it stamps with space and time and causality and all those things. So that sort of by sucking all those things into the mind, you get this idea of objectivity where the mind constructs it or bakes in those categories into the world to begin with, and then objectivity is a matter of analyzing or taking that synthesis and undoing it in the right way, in a way that's not in error. So we cannot help but see things as causal, just as we can't help but seeing things as spatial. Right. It's objective in the sense that because the mind is constructed that way, it's never going to be the case that we're going to wake up and the sun hasn't risen or that a billiard ball hits another one and it doesn't move. Well, that it hasn't risen without a contravening cause. Of course right. the sun can not rise. I, it gets I mean, that's, blown up. that's yes. implied in what, <laughs> that's implied in all that. But um, you know what I'm saying. It's the idea that the nature of the mind grounds all of this stuff so that we can talk about, let's say, inner subjectivity. And there's an idea of objectivity based on the nature of the mind as opposed to simply the nature of the world nature of the mind grounds the thing which Hume says the world couldn't ground. Okay, so I'm pretty familiar with that from Kant. Let's turn back to Wittgenstein, because there's certain things he says that sound kind of like that, and there's certain things he said that don't sound like that at all. So, for instance, time and space, he says explicitly, this is uh, 6.3611. He says, uh, we cannot compare any process with the passage of time, in quotes. There's no such thing but only with another process, say, with the movement of a chronometer. Hence, the description of temporal sequence of events is only possible if we support ourselves on another process. It is exactly analogous for space, when, for example, we say that neither of two events, which mutually exclude one another, can occur, because there is no cause why one should occur rather than the other. It is really a matter of our being unable to describe one of the two events unless there is some sort of asymmetry. And if there is such an asymmetry, we can regard this as the cause of the occurrence of the one and the non-occurrence of the other. So I understand less the way he's describing it in terms of space than I do in terms of, of time, that he's certainly not saying that we have this mental apparatus that imposes temporality on our experience. He seems to be saying that time and space are illusions. There's only relations between particular things. There's not atoms in the void because there's no void that we can make any sense of. And I think it's even stronger than that. It's that those relations are all logical. Yep. So do you buy that? Do you even know how to take that? I don't know how you reduce physics to logic. He says in uh, 6.34, he says, All propositions such as the law of causation, the law of continuity in nature, the law of least expenditure in nature, etc., all these are a priori intuitions of possible forms of the propositions of science, which whatever that means... Uh. And then he, but he, he actually explains himself. Newtonian mechanics, for example, brings the description of the universe to a unified form. Let us imagine a white surface with irregular black spots. We now say, whatever kind of picture these make, I can always get as near as I like to its description if I cover the surface with a sufficiently fine square network and now say of every square if it is white or black. In this way, I shall have brought the description of the surface to a unified form. This form is arbitrary because I could have applied with equal success a triangular or hexagonal mesh. It can happen that the description would have been simpler with the aid of a triangular mesh. That is to say, we might have described the surface more accurately with a triangular and coarser than with a finer mesh or vice versa, and so on. So the different networks correspond to different systems describing the world. 
normally he doesn't allow, as we were saying before, you to make any universal claims at all. So what the scientific theories are really saying, these general theories like of causality are kind of mechanical axioms, he says. It provides the bricks for the building of the edifice of science. He's trying to figure out a framework that will imply all the different contingent atomic facts. So by saying everything is causal, it's not actually making concrete predictions. It's like a form of trying to understand the world. Well, I want to say there's a little point earlier than that, Mark. He says, here we go with the numbers, 6.234, mathematics is a method of logic. And he goes on and talks about equations for a little while. And he says, 6.32, the law of causality is not a law, but the form of a law. Mm. The law of causality, that is a general name. And just as in mechanics, for example, there are minimum principles such as the law of least action, so too in physics there are causal laws, laws of the causal form. All such propositions, including the principle of sufficient reason. The law of continuity in nature. <laughs> Yeah, all of these are a priori insights about the forms in which the propositions of science can be cast. So to go back to the example you said before, imagine a white field with black spots on it. And I overlay a grid onto that that's made of squares. And I say, see, this is the structure of the black spots on the white field. And he says, well, you know what, though, instead of doing squares, I could do triangles or rectangles or circles, right? That grid that you overlay that gives some kind of quote-unquote structure and explains, that's his analogy for what like the law of causality or the general law as laws of physics. They're a system that is used to make sense of or order the propositions about the world. Not the world, not the actual states of affairs, because further down, he says 6.4... The sense of the world must lie outside of the world. In the world, everything is as it is, and everything happens as it does happen, and in it no value exists. If there's any value that does have value, it must lie outside the whole sphere of what happens and is the case, because all that happens and all that is the case is accidental, and what makes it non-accidental cannot lie within the world. Yep. Okay? So basically what he's saying is the world just simply is this crazy collection of states of affairs that are completely accidental. There are logical possibilities that create states of affairs, and that's what's out there. Then there are propositions or thoughts or whatever you want to call it, just the facts. Okay, the facts about the world. That's, that's the facts being the true, facts. And yep. true, true or false, right? So the facts have the sense. The facts have values. The world does not. So all these propositions of science and logic are just ways that we use to order facts to give ourselves some sort of psychological comfort that there is order <laughs> out of chaos. But the reality is we're not talking about the world. We're talking about the way that we talk about the world. When you say there's such a thing as causality, you're making a statement about the way that we think about the world, not about the way the world is, because it's completely accidental. Yep. Wow. Well, and he doesn't give an analysis of this epistemologically. He doesn't say like Kant does that we just you know, perceive it as causal, it's that when we form propositions about it, is that, is that what he's saying? He's just giving the same thing, but giving it in linguistic terms? Yeah, I think so. Mm, I don't know. Well, I think it is like Wes the linguistic is the, is the better version of Kant. Or that's, I, maybe I try and see everything through the lens of Kant. Wait, but... I mean, that's what this sounds like. When we form propositions about things happening, they inevitably come out causal. <laughs> okay, so I think... What Kant says is, I don't want to be that bold as to say what Kant says, but... An interpretation of Kant might be... An interpretation of Kant might be that Kant says the way that we experience reality, we impose a structure of causality on it, and we can't really do otherwise. Now, that may or may not be, like maybe beings from another planet would not have a different notion that wouldn't imply causality or what have you. But... Kant is literally saying experience and reality has the structure of causality because we put that structure but on it. But by the way, just the, the beings from another planet would have it as well because he thinks he derives it from the nature of experience as such. It's not just okay. causality is accidental. Causality is analytically implied by the word experience. Yeah, that's great, which I think draws a, a stronger contrast to Wittgenstein, who's basically saying reality 
And he, you notice he never uses the term reality. He uses the term the world, right? There is no causality in the world. Causality is a empty, logical construct that we use to order our thoughts or facts about the world, because to not do so would presumably be somehow chaotic and less attractive. But I think he's making a clear and explicit distinction and saying the world itself does not have any cause. It's completely accidental. Which he would have to say about the Kantian ding on seek. It sounds like he's in the ding on seek realm, except that there's logic there. There's um thing in itself. Yeah, sorry, the thing in itself. You know, it's similar to Hume and Kant in the sense that causality isn't out there in the world. For Kant, in the sense of the in the world of the Ding An Zeke, for the objective world or our world of scientific experience, Kant had a very special idea of that, where there was such a thing as causality, again, grounded in the nature of the mind. I think, Mark, what you're saying is a good contrast, that Kant could ground that in the mind, and Wittgenstein doesn't seem to be saying why it is that causality would be a form of language. It seemed like he was just saying that it's a convenient way for us to organize atomic facts, in other words, to derive them from each other, that we, if we set up some of these basic, what sound like mechanical axioms, then we can deduce a lot of stuff from them. And if the things that we can deduce from them happen to correspond with actual facts in the world, then we say, oh, this causality thing seems to work out pretty well. Right, But well, it's not that causality no. is in the world, it's just that if we assume causality and we observe some facts, like that you know, one billiard ball is on its way to hit another one, and then we look and see you know, what that predicts, oh, and it just happens to come true. That it's really contingent matter as far as anything we could know anything about, but we can make these assumptions just to try to organize. As long as we understand that that's what we're doing, it's just a shorthand to try to get from some facts to other facts, then uh, we can still use that in science as we have been all along. I think that's a good reading of it, Mark, that if you literally had to go and discover all the individual atomic facts, I'm trying to think of something that would be useful, like it would be impossible to build a house if you weren't able to create some kind of more general proposition that you yep. would call a law right. out of the facts that you've experienced and seen that's a, that's a so great that example. you could predict what kind of behavior you could expect in the future if you did X and Y, you would expect the outcome Z. And the only way you can do that is if you do have some kind of construct that makes the thoughts coherent and you have some idea of causality, consistency, and some kind of law that's going to hold across to those things. But that doesn't mean there are those laws out there. That's still just a logical construct that helps you order your thoughts. Yep. That's very good. But that suggests that we, we, we don't have the choice of seeing the world non-causally. That's the problem here that I'm having. It's not just a pragmatic maxim that we could we adhere have to or not adhere to. Right. He's, he is just saying causality itself is an a priori intuition of the possible forms of the property of science. So it's not causality itself that we could vary, but it seems like the general laws, different systems of physics, for instance, like sort of as long as they all work, like Newton's physics and Einstein's physics. Yeah, I think he's trying to say causality is logically related to this whole system of possibilities of related atomic facts. In other words, it's a logical principle as opposed to a physical principle, ultimately. It's not a... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's not about states of affairs. It's about propositions about states yep. of affairs. It's like there a layer. Go. All of these things are layered on top yeah. of propositions. But the logic is still... It's not something we make a choice about. There's a sort of substance at the bottom of things, which is determining all these logical properties and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, I've been trying to think of an example. So let's say you had a proposition. The proposition said, a feather and a stick of the same size. This stick is heavier than this feather, and they're the same size. Sure. Right? And you were trying to get to a statement that said, if you have a stick and a feather, and if they are both the same size, the stick will be heavier. So you're saying something about density or mass or what have you. All you can do from a propositional perspective is say, this stick is heavier than this feather. This stick is heavier than this feather. This stick is heavier than this feather. And they're the same size, right? And they're the same size, blah, blah, blah. In order to get to any stick that is the same size as any feather, the stick will be heavier, requires that you... In this is, goes back to Mark's talk at the beginning of the last episode about universals, right? Or claims about all this or every this or some of these. That's essentially what all the truth functional tables and what all these laws of logic and laws of mechanics, quote, and he, and he puts 
law of causality or law of mechanics in quotes, right? Because really what he's trying to say is to say that that's the case, which sounds like a law of physics, because your next step up is going to be something like sticks are more dense than feathers and density is a measure of mass in space and so on and so forth. What Wittgenstein is saying is really all you're doing is some sort of trick with truth functionality and logic, even though it sounds like science, it sounds like mechanics. Yeah, I, I think a way of getting at that is to say, well, why ask a question, keep going down the chain of causality, say, what's the foundation for mass here? And you could say, well, it's this number of electrons around the atom and blah, blah, blah. And you keep going until you get to, let's say, these basic facts of physics, which no longer have causes. And I think this is a candidate for atomic facts, by the way. And then there's no causal relation between these propositions. So all you get is the... What's the basic... You get on top Sorry, of them... Well, I don't know what it would be. It would be, let's say, you know, here's a quark, and this is what happens when you put two quarks together. But then you can't say, well, why that? What's the structure of the quark that, you know, supposing that the quark is the ultimate particle? You no longer can ask that question, why? Causality is no longer relevant here. You just have a, a bunch of bare assertions about the world, right? It's just going to be the case that the quark behaves this way, and then the rest of it is built up on that foundation. You know, I think that's what he means by accidents. I think it's just these are like commandments, and there is no reason for them. They just are. And then what's built out of them is no longer causal, then they're all truth functionally related to the other propositions. We should talk a little more about the truth functionality because this is about half of the Tractatus is talking about that the fundamental relationship between propositions is that they're truth functional of each other, right? He says all propositions are the result of truth operations on the elementary propositions. So you could take the statement A or B, and the way you define or is to say, if A or B is true, then you can make a table where there's true for A and true for B, or true for A and false for B, and so on and so forth where you get this whole system of possibilities where one side of the possibilities adds up to the statement being true and the other where, say, right, the A, compound A yep. is false and B is false. The compounds are built up out of these relationships to the truth values of P and Q. P or Q has its own truth value, true or false, and then that depends in some logical way on the truth of P and the truth of Q. Right, and by defining all these signs in terms of truth tables, what he's really saying is that it's the truth tables, that process that is basic. The signs themselves are not basic. You could define whatever signs you want. You could just take any random like configuration on truth tables and say, oh, this is the definition of the or sign, or make up your own signs. And so that was you know, fairly revolutionary. And it was also to say, for instance, he said that because not not P and P say the same thing, that proves that those are just the same proposition. Then, in other words, you could have really complicated looking things in logic that if that has the same truth table values as a very simple one, then you say, actually, those mean the same thing, right? If they're logically equivalent, he says, signs which serve... Uh, one purpose are logically equivalent. Signs which serve no purpose are logically meaningless. So he applies that to math. Seth, you mentioned earlier that he does a logicization of math, and he was not the first one to do this, and he was just sort of giving his version of it. But it was a way to say it's not that math is like that we have this empirical experience of one and two and three, and then we extrapolate from that to and so on. It's that he creates this uh, truth table definition of the various mathematical signs, right? Of number itself, the concept of number. So whereas somebody might say, you know, it's knowledge we have before birth to say two plus two equals four or all these mathematical things. We must be remembering something. What he's saying is, no, no, really numbers are all introduced in one concept. So all mathematical truths are true by definition. They're not really, a lot of other philosophers had used this, like Plato had used this to say, you know, something significant about this a priori knowledge that we have. And you say, no, 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 it's all just true by definition. It's a fact about the logic itself, about the language of numbers that you've created itself, which is all ultimately reducible to, you know, this truth table uh, analysis. Okay, I get what you're saying. I mean, I think I followed that. I got a different sort of read off of the truth table discussion that, that goes something like this. 
The significance of talking about truth functions is that a truth function gets its truth value from the truth and falsity of the propositions that are in it. Yep. A proposition gets its truth value by whether or not it pictures a state of affairs in the world. Well, an atomic proposition. For, yeah, for, uh, only in, uh, only in atomic. Uh, Okay, well, I was trying to avoid using that term, <laughs> but I'm glad both of you jumped on me. Because it sounds to me like if you can form a proposition that our criteria for what constitutes an atomic proposition is, it gets its truth value from the world. Yep. And if you get your truth value from anything other than a direct state of affairs in the world, you're a truth function. Mm-hmm. But the atomic proposition, by the way, just to clarify, it gets its truth value from sharing the logical form. Yeah, of I was about to say that. Yeah. yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's just that picture. Yeah, the picturing thing so, we just talked about last. Yeah, time. yeah. So the significance of sort of reducing everything to logic and reducing everything to truth functionality is basically to say that because number theory or mathematics does not get its truth function because it shares a logical form with a state of affairs in the world. Mm -hmm. It gets its truth function based on the truth or falsity of components somehow. It can be analyzed. Does, and... does, that, yeah. does that even make sense? Yeah, well, arithmetic can be derived from logic. You can so look it's up all, pianos, it's all axioms, and... trivially true. It's not you know, a discovery of any sort. It's not a remembered from a previous life discovery. It's just... Trivially true is true by definition. Well, like but you could say that you could just, to give the defense of the a prioriist, you could just push that back onto the logic. You could say the logic is the a priori. I mean, you know, the alternative, I think, is a legitimate possibility as well, which is to say this is just the feature of the language that's being used. I think it becomes an epistemological question, like what's in the brain to begin with and so on and so forth. I don't well, know. anyways, so he gets, he gets this whole basic, then he moves on to some kind of weirder area, so... To understand, uh, you know, these inductive principles that make up science, to prepare for that, he talks about probability, and he gives this very weird, you know, we have all these mathematical models of probability, but he says, this is a 5.153. A proposition is in itself neither probable nor improbable. An event occurs or it does not occur. There is no middle course. And he gives a, a definition of probability just based on truth grounds, which are, are features of these truth tables. So if you have a sentence A... And then you have a sentence A and B, and then A is true, you could say there's a 50% chance that the compound A and B is true, right? Because they share a certain number of rows in the truth table. So that's a very weird definition of probability. Yeah. It doesn't seem to capture what science would want out of that at all. Oh, definitely not. Science wants the laws to be able to describe behaviors in the world or even using Wittgensteinian terms, you want to be able to predict the truth value of a proposition using a scientific law. Whereas I think what Wittgenstein is saying is you can predict the truth value of the law as it's applied to the proposition, but not about the proposition itself. Probability is a weird case, though, isn't it? It can either be a matter of our ignorance about more fundamental laws, or it has to be a matter of chance, right? I don't know about the probability discussion, yeah. I mean, to say that, say, well, there's a 50-50 chance of it raining tomorrow. There's two possible explanations for that prob right, we just probabilistic don't know. assertion. One of them is that if we had all the facts, we would be able to say for certain whether it's going to rain. And the other is that at bottom, there's basic randomness in the universe, so even if we had all the facts, we wouldn't be able to say. But yet he wants to give free reign to science to do what it does, which is make generalizations about the present, which then get confirmed or disconfirmed based on observations of events that were in the future when you were to say it in the first time. So you are making predictions about the future. And Carnap you know, doesn't have a problem with that because he just says these are, these are hypotheses, right? We won't for sure know that the key is iron, but as long as you know, there are these verificational elements that can make us more and more and more sure, that's enough. It doesn't look like Wittgenstein is even giving us room for that, at least in this strict discussion of probability here. Let me try a weird metaphor. If we think of atomic facts as, say, colored particles and 
say 90% of them are red and 10% are white, and they build up the world in a certain way, and then out of that you get certain patterns at the higher level, complex ones, which you could think of as aggregates in this metaphor, patterned aggregates. So there you could say, well, there's a probability because of the prevalence and the atomic level of the red particles or marbles, let's say, you're going to get a pattern which will produce those, those causal laws will flow from that. Or even some probabilistic law, let's say, you know, like 90% of the stuff in the world's red, or I don't know. I'm trying to think about it in a visual way in order to make sense of the building up from the atomic facts to what things look like scientifically. Let's turn back to the text. 6.3, going from the probability discussion, he says, logical research means the investigation of all regularity, and outside logic, all is accident. So if you're going to be doing scientific lawmaking that involves talking about probability in the way we think that you know, talking about induction does, then you're doing logic. So high-level science right. has to be logic, which makes sense because he says that, strictly speaking, when you're talking about the world, if you make a general statement, what you're just making is a bunch of statements about individuals. So if you say all cows have two stomachs or something, it's really you're implicitly just saying that about all of the existent cows now. You're not talking about all cows in the future, all possible cows, something like that. That just doesn't even make sense. You have to be actually describing things in the world now, so even future tense doesn't make any sense, strictly speaking. Mm. So if you're doing that, and it does make sense, you so must be is... talking about logic. You must be talking about this language itself. But this you is know, also very, very... atemporal, this fact world. Time is built up out of it. Well, let me just rephrase, I think, what you were saying, Mark. Go ahead. So to take the law, the law of gravitation, there's no entity out there, gravity. If you were to reduce the facts of what's going on between objects gravitationally to the atomic facts, you would see that what we see as a physical law, a matter of physical necessity, is actually just analytic. It just flows logically from the atomic facts, right? Hey, can I take another step? Go ahead. I, I just, Wes, you just made me think of something. So the law of gravity is a great example because it sounds like what Wittgenstein is saying is that you can measure a state of affairs and see that an object falls to the ground or whatever. You can measure gravity in a particular state of affairs. So there's a state of affairs that's a specific instance of gravitational pull that shares a logical form with the world, and it becomes true. And you do that a number of times in a number of different contexts, and then you say, wow, across all of these states of affairs that share a logical form of it with the world and are true, there is this commonality from which I create this law called gravity. But the truth of the law of gravity is related to the truth function of those specific propositions about the state of affairs. The law of gravity itself does not share any logical form with the world such that you could just say the law of gravity is true in the same way that a proposition shares that form. So kind of what he's saying is, by virtue of the way I have defined all this stuff, any law, it has no logical form that it shares with the world. It's just simply a logical proposition in the same way that modus ponens is a logical proposition, but it does not. There is no modus ponens logical form in the world. Yep. Yeah, so I, actually, I think that goes for any compound propositions. Yeah, I think it would hold for any compound propositions, but it's once you get uh, that to the to me, that yeah. to me explains to me why he thinks that there is no gravity in the world per se. Yeah, he's just saying the law of gravity as a proposition does not correspond in any way with logical form to the world. Here's yeah. a quote from uh, the latter part of 6.342. So, too, the fact that the world can be described by Newtonian mechanics asserts nothing about the world. But this asserts something, namely that it can be described in a particular way in which, as a matter of fact, it is described. <laughs> that was meant to be illuminating. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Well, if you go along with this, it makes it interesting how science would be achieved because... In some sense, he's kind of foreshadowing what happens in the 20th century when, like, all physics becomes mathematics, and you just start creating all of these compound propositions, and then you run out of facts, and you're sort of just relating compound propositions to each other, and then you're like, oh, you know what? I need to find the facts that justify this, so I need to build a giant super collider. 
because I've kind of run out of, you know, we've determined all the facts mm -hmm. in Newtonian space, and now we have to kind of go to this different level. And I'm able to meaningfully create all these compound propositions of science, but the truth or non-truth of them is going to be dependent upon these atomic facts that I need to go out and find. The law of gravitation kind of a holds between propositions in a sense, not between facts. Yeah, the facts don't have laws that govern them, per se. Yeah, right. They make laws true, but yeah. laws are just propositions, too, and all propositions are independent so of there's each no, other. So there's no fact out there corresponding to the law of gravitation. It is a relationship between propositions, which, if we analyze them enough, we would get to atomic facts, which, in fact, do correspond to something in the world. But at the level of gravity... It's just this logical relationship between a bunch of propositions. Which is not a very scientifically friendly, you know, a, a yeah. conception that is very friendly to the practice of science. So you can see when the logical positivists tried to take it seriously as a way of supporting science through philosophy, like apparently that's why the verification was eventually abandoned. It was because the verificationists really wanted to have even these general Right? They weren't just treating general terms as logical sentences. They were treating them as inductive generalizations, like scientists usually suppose them, not doing something radical with them like uh, Wittgenstein was. And uh, it turned out that they had a hard time applying this verificationist principle, which says that all these very system-wide, you know, really high-level abstract laws of physics and things, at one point there was a move to, well, it's not that every single law you know, has a particular set of perceptions associated with it. It's the system as a whole has a set of perceptions associated with it. And it, it became such that they couldn't define exactly what counts as real verification so that it would rule out the metaphysics that they wanted to rule out, but it would allow the very abstract high-level scientific talk that mm. scientists were actually engaged in. And that was ultimately like the collapse of the whole thing. Interesting. Yeah, I find this kind of funny because I can kind of imagine... If you look at 6.343, he says, Mechanics is an attempt to construct, according to a single plan, all the true propositions that we need for the description of the world. The laws of physics, with all their logical apparatus, still speak, however indirectly, about objects in the world. We ought not to forget that any description of the world by means of mechanics will be of the completely general kind. For example, it will never mention particular point masses. It will only talk about any point mass whatsoever. So I have this image in my head of... Some scientists saying, oh, well, here's the scientific law. What is it? Uh, force equals mass times velocity. Is that true? Is that one? Yeah. Okay. So force equals mass times velocity. And Wittgenstein says, wow, that's great. Prove it. And the guy goes, okay, here's some more math that shows that the equation is valid. And he's like, mm, so what you did was you just showed that it's consistent with the series of signs that's consistent that something over here. And the guy's like, hmm, yeah, you're right. Well, here, here's how I'll prove it. Here's a mass, <laughs> and I'm going to throw it, and I'm going to measure what happens, and then I'm going to throw another mass at a different speed, and then I'm going to throw a different mass at a different speed, and then once I get all these things together, I'll be able to, to show you that the math works out. And so Wittgenstein says, oh, so force equals mass times velocity. What you're really saying is this particular mass thrown at this velocity equals this force. And so that one thrown at that velocity equals that force. That, that's really what it, this comes down to. Yeah. You just found a shorthand way to say that. Or in other words, the law is directed towards the propositions rather than towards the world. So that when you say F equals MV, it's not a description of the world in the sense of about the facts corresponding to the propositions. So it's the facts about this when you threw this mass and this is what happened. Rather... You take all those little separate events, you threw the mass and this is what happened, you threw the mass and this is what happened, you take that series of propositions, and then F equals MV is in a sense about those propositions. And what's interesting about that is you can see how, A, it's not very science friendly, because basically Wittgenstein's saying, yeah. anytime, always, if you want to speak meaningfully about a scientific law or, or whatever, you're going to end up having to prove it with a specific example. Yeah, But it also shows why Carnap and those guys picked up on it as verificationism, is that everything's going to have to be reducible to something you can actually show and point at. I, I love the poetic justice of this, where it starts to <laughs> devour itself. You know, and it's, it's the Hume-Kant problem all over again, because 
Kant comes along and starts worrying that Hume's skepticism concerning causality makes even science something that's not objective and that can't be. So it's sort of like a repetition of that. You know, once you come along and you're anti-metaphysical, it's a slippery slope to being anti-science. I find that very interesting. Yeah. And so this is why he makes a little nod to Hume in this. I don't know if you caught that in um, 6.36311. You guys read this a lot more carefully than I did. (laughs) I wouldn't go that far. He says, um, it's a hypothesis that the sun will rise tomorrow. And this means that we do not know whether it will rise. Because just before and after this, he talks about induction being a psychological need, the law of induction. So if you figure out all the physics and the physical laws that arise from the propositions about the physical facts that that tell you that the earth spins around the sun and yada, 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 right? So you basically say the earth is a mass that revolves around the sun and rotates on its axis. And, you know, you have all these laws that describe that. And then you say, therefore, the sun will rise tomorrow. You're essentially doing kind of a deductive maneuver because of what we just talked about, which is to say that the fact of the earth spinning and all this stuff is completely independent from it having done it two days ago and doing it two days from Mm -hmm. now, and that you just have this apparatus to describe it. What he says is what you're really doing, you can't ever deduce from a physical law of nature, something is going to happen. You induce, is that the right word? Yeah. He's like, you do it because you have the psychological need to believe that it's going to happen. Because there's no such thing as physical necessity. Uh, the states of affairs are accidental. There's only logical necessity. And, and so logical, it's, that's yeah. totally human. Totally. And he's even using the sun rising, which is the human example. Now, if it turns out that's awesome. that in the whole set of atomic facts that the sun always does rise, you know, all things being equal, we're, we're ruling out any of the cases where the sun gets blown up and all that stuff. If you looked at the whole field of facts and everything was such that that supposition about the sun flowed logically from all the atomic facts, there's your logical necessity. But the problem is that at this point in time, we can't know that whole field of facts. It could still be a law, which, again, it's the law is directed towards the propositions. It's about the propositions. But if you take right. the whole set of propositions, and it is the case that every proposition is in accord with the sun always rising then that law, in a sense, holds. Because there is, again, there's no physical necessity that it's that way. You could have been in a world where gravity held every time but once. There's just, for a split second, gravity was gone. And the world behaved completely bizarrely against the law of physics. There's no logical inconsistency to that. So if you took the whole set of propositions, you'd see that little errant group of propositions that didn't fit the overall pattern. Yeah, I actually suddenly am a lot warmer to Wittgenstein. Because I, I have been... I've been kind of a Humean for a long time where, you know, I bought the idea that it's my experience of things happening over and over again that makes me expect that they will happen again. Mm -hmm. The fact that something happens over and over and over in my past experience makes me think it will happen again. And that I used to get very passionate about the idea that I couldn't care less about the laws of physics when it comes to me wondering whether or not the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Like no amount of physics explained to me, no symbols on paper, no telling me about gravity and all that stuff was ever going to convince me, you know, that had no bearing on it. It was all about my experience of the way the world worked. And Wittgenstein has just given me a really elegant way of like telling you that your laws of physics really don't do much for me deductively, that the best I can do is inductively reason to future events. It's a very clever and elegant way of pointing out the limits as well of science. You know, I started off, I think about 30 minutes ago, I was talking about generating these general laws in order to be able to predict behavior that you couldn't theoretically Mm -hmm. do things like build buildings without, you know, having laws of engineering and mechanics. So the laws themselves describe the behavior, it gives you the structure, but you still have to essentially inductively assume that the materials you're working with are going to behave as if they did in the past. So there's like this combination of faith and reason. And what's, or, what's interesting? Sorry, experience and logic. So your experience helps you generate the logic, which sets your expectations for the future. But there's still, it's your experience that has to generate your assumption that you will actually get what you expect. Yeah. And the good news is that happens enough of the time that you don't have to worry about it. But only with like rocks and stones and concrete. <laughs> 
<laughs> not with people. And it preserves, but it still preserves necessity too. It's not just this kind of skepticism that gets rid of necessity entirely, which is an amazing thing. Yeah, um, it's a good point. This is the first time I've thought about the science part of it. It's an amazing thing he does. Whether it holds or not is another thing, but it's the attempt to reduce to logic. It... Let me give a quote to cap it off. 6.371. At the basis of the whole modern view of the world lies the illusion that the so-called laws of nature are the explanations of natural phenomena. So people stop short at natural laws as something unassailable, as did the ancients at God and fate. And they both are right and wrong. But the ancients were clear insofar as they recognize one clear terminus, whereas the modern system makes it appear as though everything were explained. I guess I've always thought of scientific laws as just ways of ordering things that we think. It's not like when we're taught these things in the first place, it makes it seem like the law is actually causing things to happen. Like as if the right. Newton's laws are making this happen, like, which <laughs> is totally mysterious. <laughs> right. <laughs> how could a law possibly come out of the sky and, and cause this to happen? Or how did the law get the way it is in the first place? It is unexplained. Oh, because it, it's the most simple law, and God likes simplicity. Like it, it has... <laughs> Speaking of God, this reminds me of the whole debate about whether God does everything by fiat or if he's bound by, let's say, the rules, you know, the rules of the universe, which are prior to him. What Wittgenstein is doing is saying that these facts are in a way just there, you know, when he says they're, they're all contingent, they're just there by fiat, all those facts. And then rules flow out of those in the same way that they might flow out of God's arbitrary commandment. Well, it certainly would be interesting to read a Wittgensteinian who buys you know, this general viewpoint, but still is willing to talk about ancient metaphysical questions like, can God lift a stone heavier than... <laughs> Can, heavier than God can lift. What? <laughs> but I still, I still see him as a metaphysician, you know, talking about substance and all that stuff. This is an ontology. You know, what's interesting, too, about this now, guys, is now that we've really hammered this down and you have this really, really kind of strict understanding of state of affairs, proposition, logical form, truth value, complex proposition, you know, truth value above that, right? Now, when I'm, I'm reading through what starts on 6.42, so too is it impossible for there to be propositions of ethics. Propositions can express nothing that is higher. It is clear that ethics cannot be put into words. Ethics is transcendental. Ethics and aesthetics are one and the same. Wow. That's a very humane point, too, aesthetics and, and ethics. But... Yeah, I think that's amazing and poetic. Yeah. But I think this is where people then say, did he just create space for kind of another category outside of logic that's called the transcendental? Yeah. That is outside of logical possibility and impossibility? Right, because it's those just, categories it, do not apply to the kind of thing you're talking about. It. <laughs> that's, that's what you mean by outside. Here's another way of putting well, it. I, no, no, no. If there are all oh, these things that are shown in the world that are not facts, you know, whether they are the logic or even some of these metaphysical essentially metaphysical ruminations in the Tractatus, if you're talking about language or about something which is not of the world, you can include among those things, things like soul and God and so on and so forth it makes room for it in that sense, I think if you take the meaninglessness or the nonsense thing as non-pejorative, which it I'm looks, content to right, that's a reading that you could run with I think as far as what he thinks about it you know, if you're looking at 6.5, say, you know, if a question can be put at all, then it can also be answered. A question can only exist where there is an answer, and this is only where something can be said. And we've already, you know, talked about what can be said or not. You know, he, he really seems to come down. It's not just, oh, but we can only have certain of knowledge of things of this. The way he ends it, right? Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. In other words, I'm not saying like Kant is, that, oh, you now have free reign to talk about faith. Maybe it's on one interpretation of Kant. You know, we understand that scientific knowledge doesn't apply to these transcendental things, so you can then speculate all you want as long as you know that you're just speculating or your actions are connected to these transcendental things by practical reason or these other mechanisms that Kant has of, of showing that ethical truths are the case we talking about that in a couple episodes from here. But it just seems he wants to just shut it down, Wittgenstein. Well, it's, it's easy to say no, that no, after you've had... I don't think that's... And it's easy to say that after you've had your fun. It's like the girl who uh, becomes puritanical late in life after she's uh, had her fun early on. Where's the fun for everyone else, right? 
tre- I, Wittgenstein I don't can do a whole treatise talking about things which are essentially he's talking about what's shown. He's not talking about. I mean, what proposition in the Tractatus is empirical? There's, there's nothing. It's all metaphysics. Well, it's all illegitimate in some sense, except for maybe truth tables and the strictly logical stuff. But the rest of it is strictly speaking nonsense. So, see, like Russell in the intro and Carnap in talking about this seem to think that why can't you have a second order language to talk about what your language can and can't do? So Carnap says that he doesn't really think a lot of the stuff that, according to Wittgenstein's strict definition, is senseless really are senseless. That even as you say, if everything in the Tractatus is really off limits or everything is not pure logic, then this discussion of you know, there's some illegitimate talk and there's some legitimate talk is itself illegitimate because you can't get on both sides of the limit to talk about where the limit is. Like, it just shows itself, is the way he puts it. And Carnap just denies that, of course, it makes sense. You understand it perfectly well. And it makes sense in a way that you know, everything is water or there is a God or there is not a God or everything is ideas or everything is matter, in which those don't make sense. I really do see those as you can still think that a lot of the stuff... Wittgenstein says in here is has sense, but, it's, but yet still rule out metaphysics proper. Well, it's senseless, but not nonsense. But it's senseless in the strict sense of the logical tautologies being, you know, senseless. But it still is, that's a technical meaning of senseless. But yeah, I think you could say all that stuff is not nonsense. But, you know, when he starts talking about the world as being composed of facts, he's no longer just talking about language. And that's where he gets into. I don't. I don't see how Carnap could say that that's not metaphysics. You know. Yeah, that yeah, that part in point. particular. I agree with that. That part in particular. That. that talking about particulars and stuff in the way we were in the whole first episode here. I mean, I think there's a reason why, at least in this bit. I, I don't know how much Carnap or other folks talk about that in other contexts. But the problem is, you know, they deprive themselves of the ability to. Again, I hate to harp on this, but I just don't know how you justify a verificationist principle according to the verificationist premise. You can't say verificationism holds because of something I observed in the world. No, that's true. You could never prove verificationism. Or even inductively prove it. Deductively or inductively. Yeah, it would have to be the truth functionality of verificationism would depend upon a bunch of facts. Right, well, all, all of them... A bunch and of I, propositions. You know, I, I don't, since we just read this little piece of Carnap, I don't know that we should... He probably has a response to this. I know, yeah, I know Russell sure himself says in the Logical Atomism piece that the postulate that there are multiple things in the world, he says, is ultimately undefended. Like, he admits that there are certain things that you start with, and you can sort of, as you work out the things that follow from that, you can sort of see, okay, that makes more and more sense, but you can't ultimately go back and give a proof for it. And I think that's the way verificationism is itself supposed to show up. It's just... It's we understand how language works. We understand Hume's point about the connection between legitimate language and perception. And so it's just trying to go with that intuition. And you can say, it's not that you can prove it by induction, but you can show cases where clearly someone does not know what he's talking about because he's talking about things that have no relationship at all to any, right? You can pick up paradigm cases of nonsense of this sort. And paradigm cases, on the other hand, of things that very clearly have a verificationist basis, have a basis in perception, and say, look how much clearer that thing is than these wacky discussions of how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. Mm -hmm. Can I just say that I'm now completely distracted? Now that all the work that we did today and the last time, which I think, you know, whatever the listener may feel or whatever you guys may feel, I think has greatly elucidated my understanding of this and given me a much greater appreciation Same. for somebody who I used to just be very dismissive and angry about. I used about. to think he was a fraud. I was <laughs> pretty close to that myself. I'm motivated right now to just spend a good portion of time on just the 6.4 section. Now that I kind of understand... I don't want to say that. Now that I have an interpretation of all the stuff that comes before, I'm really kind of interested to go and look at this stuff about ethics and, you know, the transcendental and so on. Because I, in the context now of what he's saying, it makes me think that he's created a space, a metaphysical space, if you will, for God, ethics, and all that. And I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. 
the mystical. I guess this is what people like me get fixated on in this text, though, because it's always yep. some clown like me that writes a book like Wittgenstein and the mystical. <laughs> you know, it's like it's somebody who studied Heidegger. <laughs> Should we throw out some random quotes from the 6.4 section to contemplate? So, for instance, 6.43, when he's just said, you know, ethical talk is off limits. If good or bad willing changes the world, it can only change the limits of the world, not the facts, not the things that can be expressed in language. In brief, the world must thereby become quite another. It must, so to speak, wax or wane as a whole. The world of the happy is quite another than that of the unhappy. What do you make of that? It makes me think of the whole mind-body thing again, the idea that the mental doesn't do anything within the world, right? You know, we talked about that with Leibniz, this conservation of mass and energy. So good or bad willing cannot change the world. It cannot alter the facts. And so when you say change the limits of the world... Well, well I'll tell you what, yeah. the interpretation... So I don't know which translation the you Ogden. have. Okay, the one that's on the Gutenberg... Mm -hmm. This is the translation, so let me read the previous statement as well. It is impossible to speak about the will insofar as it is the subject of ethical attributes, and the will as a phenomenon is of interest only to psychology. If the good or bad exercise of the will does alter the world, it can alter only the limits of the world, not the facts, not what can be expressed by means of language. In short, the effect must be that it becomes an altogether different world. It must, so to speak, wax and wane as a whole. The world of the happy man is a different one from that of the unhappy man. So too, at death, the world does not alter, but comes to an end. See, now, it makes me think of Sartre. You know, he talks about emotions coloring your world. This is part of why we have this ultimate freedom, is because we have the power to interpret, maybe not just at will, but something within us can interpret our situation in different ways. So even if we're in chains, we can interpret it such that we can feel very free or feel not free or, you know, we can remake the world. So again, like the world of the happy is very different from the world of the unhappy. It sounds to me like he just created a demarcation between subjective experience exactly. of the world and what you might call objective experience exactly. of the world. So yeah. the facts are the basis that allow us to have a commonality, the world that we share, but anything that's not related to facts, psychological, the will, ethical, and all that defines my subjective experience of the world. And Yeah, the subjective, that's where the limits come in, or the world as a whole. That's another thing in a way that's only shown, but can't be said, right? You can't refer to the mind as an object. I think the, the concept of, trend, and I'm speculating wildly based on just a couple of sentences, but his concept of transcendence must be pretty rigorous because he's really talking about something that is above and separate from the facts of the world, and yet at the same time is manifest in it or somehow arises. It's kind of difficult. Later on, just a few sentences later, he says, God does not reveal himself in the world. And we know that, you know, ethics is transcendent, and yet somehow they must be connected or related in some way, shape, or form. I don't know. Just this last section is kind of interesting. 6.44. Oh, sorry. Yep. That's exactly where I was going. That's it I is not that. how things are in the world that is mystical, but that it exists. Which, by the way, justifies my previous assertion that getting around the issue of existence and non-existence as being a pain in the ass. Well, here's another point in there, 6.4312. The temporal immortality of the soul, that is to say its eternal survival after death, is not only in no way guaranteed, but this assumption in the first place will not do for us what we always tried to make it do. Is a riddle ever solved by the fact that I survive forever? Is this eternal <laughs> life not as enigmatic as our present one? The solution of the riddle of life in space and time lies outside space and time. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. And here, if you tie these two things together, it is not how things are in the world that is mystical, but that it exists. Yep. And skip down. Skepticism is not irrefutable, but obviously nonsensical when it tries to raise doubts where no questions can be asked. For doubt can exist only where a question exists, a question only where an answer exists, and an answer only where something can be said. So the mystical fact of existence cannot be spoken sensibly about. So to be a skeptic is to be completely confused and just spout nonsense. See, I don't think nonsense is all confusion, because I think... Sorry, it's nonsensical. 
Because okay, because you're basically like, strictly speaking, six point five one is also nonsensical. That's the irony of all this. Yes, that's true. But <laughs> you know, but I still agree. It, it is strictly speaking. Oh, he says senseless in this translation. It says nonsensical in mine. I should get the wow, German, but that's because those are very those mean two different things for him. How about this one? The next six point five two. We feel that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of life remain completely untouched. Of course, then there are no questions left, and this itself is the answer. <laughs> I'm a Buddhist, uh, man. I'm just going to become a Buddhist. Problem is clearly not a question to be answered. What is the sound of two hands clapping? One hand clapping. Why did I say two hands? <laughs> That's a question with an answer. The same reason I asked earlier whether God could lift a stone heavier than he could lift. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. It's funnier that way. <laughs> so I've considered in the past, the very recent past, as a matter of fact, becoming one of those crazy cult leaders and retiring to a compound. And, do, you have the, you know, getting... do you have the charisma for that? <sighs> I didn't say I'd be successful at it. <laughs> um, I just said I was considering it. Now, when you're starting with a cult, do you start with just like a couple people to test it out? Or is there like a minimum number of people who's like peer pressure against each other? You know, creates the cult, so you need to start with a minimum of 10 in the first place. No, no, no. I, th I, I think you can start with even an individual following, and you just sort of build it up, and then it gets its critical mass. Because, you know, you could just have three or four disciples, you know, and they could convert other people, or they could help you spread whatever it is your doctrine of. But if I don't turn the 6.4 section into some kind of poem that then I can <laughs> post on my wall here, I may use it as a basis for some kind of transformative religion, new religion. Yeah, what are we talking about? This podcast is the perfect method for uh, building a cult. <laughs> yeah, so Especially when we get into this I, mystical stuff. I don't know, but I can't be sharing power with you guys. If I form a cult, I'm going solo. <laughs> I'm sorry. How do you know we won't be your disciples? That's a good point. Mark clearly won't because he's already solved all those questions for himself. He doesn't need me to guide him. He's not a lost sheep. You need, some uh, weak, you need to find some weak-minded people. I'm pretty weak-minded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flexible. <laughs> because I, you know, I don't believe that the whole you know, consistency is uh, the hobgoblin of uh, big old fat minds or whatever that is. You know, so I might have reached some conclusions, but the next day I'm like, oh, Seth wants me to be a slave? Eh, okay. <laughs> I just want to be accepted, even if it means being Seth's slave. <laughs> I think I'd be satisfied. You said about slavery. I, what, what immediately made your mind go from well, cult to slavery? Well, that's, that's where my mind was. Like, I, if I got three or four followers, like, that's probably enough, because then they could do my laundry. They could whatever needs doing. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, <laughs> I totally agree. I really don't think the need is great. I'm certainly not the kind of person that feels like I have to have a flock of millions. I think, you know, I think no, though it's the, I'm no Southern Baptist preacher in Dallas. It's kind of like a small business that you might think like, oh, to do my small business, I just need a couple helpers to, you know, get this idea that I have that I serve as I provide myself. But then once you have those people, they're like, well, I could have, you know, have a larger infrastructure and do more stuff and do all that. You'd have the same thing. So if I have my couple of disciples, I'd be like, eh, is that enough people to sleep with? Eh, I could use a few more, you know. Exactly. I could, exactly. Maybe I could have some of them making babies that I could then train from birth, and then you know, you just start thinking bigger and bigger. Exactly. Yes. But you don't end that's, it all with a suicide thing. That's just stupid. That's just wasteful. No, you need I totally to. Agree you need that. to sustain your cult. However, it should destruct somehow upon your death. Like Scientology, something went wrong with that. Yeah, well, that's why those things are so persona heavy, you know. And once the leader dies, it's always hard to hold those things together. As as I it's, think mine as would planned. somehow, maybe I could tie these three things together. I could do kind of the Wittgensteinian mystical, the book of the subgenius. Do you remember that from mm -hmm. Junior Bob Dobbs, the book of the subgenius from back in the eighties? And then also somehow golf and the four hour work week. Like if I can pull all those things together, I think I might be onto something. Nice. And I'm kind of excited about imposing some kind of clothing restriction that makes everybody, <laughs> that makes people wear like uh, semi-puritanical, very, very blandly colored outfits. Like the, you guys do know about the compound with the church out here in Texas that they came and took all the kids away. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. The women all wear those dresses that are very plain and yeah. Don't kind don't of do that. Set. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> Something Dude, more that creative. A, hire just do a it. hire a fashion designer. Do it, it can still nudist. be plain. It can Why still can't be plain. you be nudist if it's if it's private yeah. enough? Yeah, no, no. You don't want to play golf nude. Yeah, not attractive. I mean, you have to be nude. Just everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Oh my. All right, so, well, well, do we want to generalize from this? I, I take this attack on metaphysics. I mean, we, we can interpret it in a lot of ways. And some of them, even though I don't like, you know, the specific principle of verificationism, I feel like there's something behind it. If these problems, the traditional philosophical problems, existence of God, mind-body relations, if these persist, it's tempting to think that there's there's something wrong about the way that they're being asked, that there's something wrong with the questions if we just can't get rid of them in any way. And if you take a pragmatic turn, for instance, you could say, depending on what the character of your pragmatism is, that, well, since they don't have any, you know, the existence of God, for instance, I'm very much, I've ruled out versions of God that would make me have to suck up to him. Like, those just don't make any sense. Like, why would a God who's so cool want me offering lambs to him or, or wasting my time. <laughs> so I'm not ruling out God, a God. I've just ruled out the versions of God that would make me do shit. So therefore, <laughs> effectively, it, I don't care. I don't care whether there's a God or not because it has no practical upshot for me. So I guess that's the lesson I get out of this or that's the variation that I take from some of this. Do you yeah, but your problems are still there, right? Well, yeah, okay. Not being able to create a philosophical system to justify the existence of the being that you think is necessary to underlie your ethical system still doesn't solve your problems for you. All those problems are still there. Well, not all of them. Like, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Like, there are lots and lots of ethical problems and things that are, you know, the problem of evil. We talked about in, in the Leibniz one. You could say, oh, this is just an intractable problem. Well... No, just be an atheist, and you don't have a problem of evil. evil there's just evil. Solved. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I'm not saying all the problems go away, but some of them sure go away. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of those problems are that close to the problem of evil, where just getting rid of a questionable presupposition will get rid of the problem. Because the assertion, for instance, that it's just grammar, this or that, you know, it's just a uh, illegitimate way of speaking about things. Again, I don't see that you can justify that except by saying what you said, which is that, well, then, then it dispels all the problems. But why think the world has to be essentially unproblematic as opposed to problematic? Especially when you consider the fact that it being problematic is built in, even within any scientific system. Once you get to the ultimate premises or the ultimate particles, those things as uncaused, as the first things in the causal chain are essentially irrational. So the problem persists at the level, let's say, of the atomic fact. Once you've boiled everything down, once you've figured out all your laws and gotten to the bottom of things, the bottom of the things is itself unsatisfying and problematic. So Seth, I suppose as a Heideggerian, I know one of his fundamental questions was, why is there something rather than nothing? Which is essentially what Wittgenstein raises here. And I remember studying that and like finding that a not very inspiring question at all. <laughs> So actually, uh, Heidegger's question was not, why is there something rather than nothing? His big question was, we use the term being all the time in lots of different ways. And we talk about being, but nobody's ever sat down and tried to figure out exactly what it is. He does have some lectures, I think, where he addresses that question of why is there something rather than nothing. And it is an issue, but his big issue with being was something different. How do you address the charge that that's just a matter of grammar and that no, no such thing as being as a uh, substantive term. That's just an illegitimate use. I think Russell says something like that in what we read. Show me that that's the case in all or, let's say, most of the languages in the world, and then we'll have that conversation. You're saying that if something's a category mistake, then some languages should not have that mistake in them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, or I'm saying that if you're just basically speaking to me in English and you say that English has a grammatical flaw or English has a grammatical structure that makes that confused and what have you. And I would say, okay, what about German or French or Japanese yeah, or Russian? I'm, I'm sympathetic to that as well. Why not think that the categories of language, in fact, are reflective of the 
categories of existence or, or being. It's hard to give a reason either way. You might suppose that they're deceptive, but I think that's just a bare assertion. Well, one of the points about Wittgenstein we haven't brought up in there, but just to pull this back to Descartes, I mean, a lot of people think that Descartes' emphasis on, on the subject was because of a grammatical mistake that, you know, we say, I think, no, there's a subject there, I, but really our experience is just of thoughts. And Wittgenstein makes that exact point that all we have is the contents of our experience. We don't experience an I. So the subject, the metaphysical subject is transcendental as well. It is, Something. but it doesn't mean there's no subject. The I is in the form of the thoughts. To say there's an I, and this goes back to Kant, is to say that these thoughts, they aren't just disparate and unconnected. They are connected within a certain domain. So you can say, yes, there's not an I as a thing or a substance or an object out there in the world, but I think it is helpful to hypothesize it as a form of something or something that's shown. It's a way of saying that these representations are held together in a certain way. That makes sense. Just to read that portion, I, I think he's saying something stronger than that. Right? This is uh, 5.63. I am my world, the microcosm. The thinking presenting subject, there is no such thing. If I wrote a book, the world as I found it, I should also have to have therein to report on my body and say which members obey my will and which do not, etc. This then would be a method of isolating the subject, or rather of showing that in an important sense there is no subject. That is to say, of it alone in this book mention could not be made. The subject does not belong to the world, but is a limit of the world. Which I don't think he's saying there that, like Kant says, that the I is a, is a structure of our experience. I mean, I can't say, oh, what distinguishes my thoughts from your thoughts? Oh, because mine are mine, and they're linked by the ego, because really we don't experience other people's thoughts at all. Right. I don't think he, he says it's an ego as a... Uh, in the I, was, I was, guess I was more thinking Husserl, but... I, I think, um, again, he's using that when he says it's... He's absolutely right. Kant would say it's not a thing, too. Because, of, again, you're talking about the strict distinction between what's an object within the world and what can only be shown, but... It's not just the mind that's in that realm. It's in logic, and it's arguably certain propositions of science. But, but he's not saying, like Wittgenstein says explicitly in other places, stuff like the relation between the proposition and the fact is something that can't be spoken of, but it can be shown. He doesn't say here that the I is something that is but just when he shown calls the it... relationship between the ego and our experience. No, it's just the ego is not part of our experience at all. He's very... When he's, like but Hume. He's, he talks about it as the limits of the world, right? Read that passage earlier. I forget which one it is. When he the subject does not belong to the world, but it is a limit of the world. I guess I'm yeah. not sure what that means, right? He, I, he, see, he, I take all of on... these things in terms of form. When you distinguish between, say, facts and objects versus which are ultimately empirical versus the forms of things, including you know any structure, including the, the law of gravity or anything that's built up out of those bare facts. So much of the world is shown in that sense. And, you know, like logic, the laws of science, it's something shown that's ultimately related to those atomic facts. But then when you get to the whole, if you try and stand outside of that huge set of facts exhibiting its structure, even though the structure is not a thing within it, within that set. That's where I think you get the sort of uh, metaphysical position and you start talking about subject and this and that. See, I so, think when he says the limit, it's like he's talking about the limits, it's like a horizon. Or so later he says, right before that eternal life quote that I had, he says, our life is endless in the way that our visual field is without limit. So, you know, a horizon does not show us the limits of the world. It sort of points to there being something beyond that. I mean, is, I mean, is that... Well, you're talking so about... You're taking, a, we're talking about a limit in one case and then limitlessness in another. A, a, a limit that is limitlessness. Yeah, I, I think that's what he's saying in all these cases, that it points to more things, not transcendental ego things, but, you know, so my visual experience right now, my experience of myself is such that I experience that, oh, I could move 20 feet ahead of me and see some different stuff. That's what the limit is, is that none of that points to, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem see what the you're same saying. way that like as, an... as Husserl or Kant to point to, oh, there's an ego that's organizing these things. It's a much more open-ended. I, you know, I, I read something about Wittgenstein, which was just to say that Wittgenstein is a, you know, a straight materialist, which is to say that you know, all this really reveals is, oh, there are more facts out there, more facts, more facts, and they're all going to be, well, 
I don't know if materialism is totally relevant there, at least on this interpretation that I'd read, that these were all going to be still, you know, material and very mundane relations between individual things. And so that's what sort of the outsideness of our experience is as we experience it, is that there's more of the same if we keep going, just like in math. We know we can keep counting and there'll be more of the same. That unlike Kant, unlike these other folks, the outsideness is not pointing toward transcendental stuff in a positive way. That stuff is just, it's just off limits. It's just outside. It's, it's Again, off limits for Kant, too. Kant isn't, because the ego would be a, like a ding on Zeke, it's, it's like a convenient model in a way, just like the atom. So you don't say the ego is there causally as if it were this thing that's grind, sure. grinding the thoughts into, it's just the form of the thoughts shows itself in, in a way, a convenient way of talking about that form. Is to use yeah, the word I just, ego, I guess I just, even I though that sounds like a reification. But any talk about structure, it sounds like an illegitimate reification, including gravity. I guess I'm just not sure what the structural feature in, in question is here for Wittgenstein. But that's really all, like many of these things, because he should keep talking. He should not just <laughs> say these little cryptic things and move on to something else and make a whole ethical treatise in a matter of 20 lines. He should, like Husserl or like Kant... Keep talking until it is clearer what he is talking about. And so that makes me conclude that Wittgenstein is, in fact, an asshole. Do you, do you really <laughs> want him waiting, to write like Husserl? <laughs> do, would you really prefer to be reading Husserl? No, actually, what I prefer <laughs> is like a modern philosopher. And I'm learning this with a couple of these philosophers of mind. We've been preparing for our philosophy of mind episode that we'll eventually have and reading multiple things by the same authors to sort of see where they are over time. And I know just the way that these academics, they'll write basically the same book again and again and yeah. again. And they'll add some new stuff. And like, you'll, you'll also, so you get the benefit of uh, their further experience and further thought and you know, other things they've read. And then some of the earlier stuff will focus more on one topic. So it's still worth reading that and not just disregarding it. But if you read enough of it, you really get a damn good picture of what they believe. <laughs> and really all the, the points of attack that they consider you know, worth remarking about about it whereas this dude so he you know this was the only book published in his lifetime and the philosophical investigations which is the other one that you know everybody knows about is i guess something that was part of it was prepared for publication part of it is just like journal stuff that's put together in any case it's this dude's scratch pad that he's expecting us to follow along with and that is just fundamentally rude yeah yeah <laughs> But on the other hand, something cryptic does maybe get you thinking. I often use that as the definition of good philosophy, that what I like to read is stuff that I read a paragraph and then I turn and like write a paragraph myself or write two pages of stuff. I don't necessarily do that anymore, but when I was, yeah. you know, especially as an undergrad, like I would just be all over that stuff. On the other hand, if the paragraph that you're writing is trying to figure out what the hell he was trying to say, <laughs> maybe that's not as fruitful as... You know, the things that drive you to make up your own theories and stuff. Maybe it's just <laughs> distracting from actual thinking that you can be doing, trying to figure out what this doofus is trying to mutter his way through. <laughs> just to leave it on a nasty note. <laughs> well, this is where I'm not think... so anti-secondary reading, you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, see what this, other geniuses this is... have thought about this. Yeah, this is perhaps the point at which we should remain silent. <laughs> I think that's a good point.